we present Kenneth Williams, Clement Freud, Peter Jones and Sheila Hancock in just a minute. And as the minute waltz fades away, here to tell you about it is our chairman, Nicholas Parsons. Thank you very much indeed, and welcome once again to Just a Minute. And once again, I'm going to ask our four contestants to speak, if they can, for just one minute on some unlikely subject, without hesitation, without deviation from the subject on the card, and without repetition. And according to how well they do this, they will gain points, or their opponents will gain points. And if you don't already know the game, the rest will, I'm sure, become obvious as we play it. And this week, we're going to begin with our lady, Sheila Hancock. Will you start the show this week? And the subject that Ian has sort of for you is lights. Can you talk to us for 60 seconds on lights starting now? When I was a little girl, it was one of my dreams to have my name in lights up outside a theatre. When I grew up, however, and I saw that happen, I just stood there and said, so what? However, my father took a photograph of it and carried it in his wallet until the day he died. So it was worth it after all. In the theatre... Uh, Kenneth Williams, you have challenged. Hesitation? Yes, I, was I agree. Oh, no, definitely hesitation. <laughs> I've got definitely. a bad I chest. Think, I think there's no question about it, is there, Nicholas? There's no question about it. No, I think she'd moved us so much with yes, the story. Yes, moving, but, but moving. she hesitated. Yeah. Uh, and she hesitated. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> definitely. She didn't move fast enough. No, exactly. exactly. Uh, Kenneth, I agree with your challenge, so you gain a point for a oh, correct good. challenge. Oh, good. I you, might win. I might win. You might. You <laughs> won before, and you might again. And you take over the subject, which is lights, and there are 37 seconds left starting now well of course most people know this in conjunction with the liver liver and your lights <laughs> uh, <laughs> Freud has challenged why uh, two livers yes there were two livers you can only have one yeah. liver you know no. <laughs> in this game that is um, Clement Freud I agree with your challenge so you gain a point and you take over the subject there are 31 seconds left for lights starting now kidneys on the other hand uh, Dan Peter <laughs> Jones has challenged what? Not talking about the other hand. <laughs> <laughs> Supposed to be talking about the liver. Yes. Uh, so what is the challenge, Peter? Uh, Are you saying deviation? Deviation. 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 Yes, I don't think, uh, uh, truthfully, he had quite a chance to establish that uh, uh, this kidney business, which is probably, on the other hand, something else. But... Well, once he'd established it, it would have been much too late. <laughs> <laughs> it had been too late for you to get in, Peter, yes. but I think it was a very good attempt, but I'm afraid, as only three seconds have gone, I must disagree with the challenge, uh, leave uh, with Clement Freud, who's gained another point for an incorrect challenge, and there are 28 seconds left, Clement, starting now. Come under the loose heading of awful, spelt O... <laughs> Uh, Sheila Hancock has challenged. Was it hesitation? Not quite, no. no. I'm sorry, Sheila. It wasn't like yours, I'm afraid. 25 seconds to continue with lights, Clement, starting now. If you go north towards the Hebrides, you are likely early in the morning to catch across the shimmering waves a sight of flickering lights. And there's many a navigator who has thought this was nothing worse than a mermaid, when all the time it was the northern lights breathing down tinkling at sailors. Uh, uh, Sheila Hancock challenge. That was hesitation. That was, that was hesitation. hesitation. <laughs> and Sheila, you've done what Clement Freud has often been accused of, which he does very cleverly, got in not only just before the whistle, half a second before <laughs> the whistle. Well, the hesitation, I'd like to say, was waiting for the whistle. Ah, ah. ah well, uh, you don't right normally wait it, for it, Clement. Ah, Seems about time it blew. Ah. So, Sheila Hancock, I agree with the challenge. You have half a second for lights starting now. <laughs> the whistle tells us that 60 seconds is up, and whoever is speaking at the moment the whistle is blown gains an extra point, and this occasion it was Sheila Hancock. Sheila, you now have two points, but you're one behind Clement Freud, who is the leader at the end of the first round. Uh, Peter Jones, will you begin the second round? Swash buckling. That's thrown you back on your heels, I think, slightly, Peter, but uh, <laughs> will you come out in a swash buckling manner and talk about that subject for 60 seconds, starting now? Buckling is a useful, nutritious, appetizing uh, smoked fish which can be used in lieu of hors d'oeuvre or the inevitable soup. 
by a host who is anxious to please his guests. And it is a useful alternative. Um, Clement Foyle's challenge, why? Useful. Too yes, useful. we've had more than one useful, I'm afraid, uh, Peter. So I must agree with the challenge. Clement gains a point. And the subject, which is swashbuckling, Clement, 41 seconds left, starting now. Before I was enrolled as one of Robin Hood's new young men, I went in... Uh, Sheila Hancock's challenge, what? Don't believe he was ever... Quite right, quite right, Sheila. Right, 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 right. A very old young man. I think he was ever man. enrolled as one of... I don't think Robin Hood's new young men exist, except in Clement Freud's fertile imagination. Mm. So, uh, Sheila, I agree with your challenge. Mm. You'll take the subject of swashbuckling, Thank and there are 36 it's seconds be one left. Of days. You should buckle your swash crosswise across your front. Uh, Clement Freud's challenge again. Cross, cross. No, a cross, cross wise and a cross. cross. Oh, you yes. fool, you should have listened more carefully. <laughs> <laughs> she's not a BA for nothing, you know. <laughs> oh, she's academic. Yes. Oh. And Clement was trying very hard, but unsuccessfully, so Sheila has another point. 32 seconds for swash buckling, uh, Sheila, starting now. Then your trousers will remain up. These were worn by knights of old. And. Uh, Kenneth Williams. Deviation. If they wore by nights of old, they wouldn't have had trousers. <laughs> they yes, had but... trousers underneath their armour. They weren't they trousers, they were tights. <laughs> they didn't go around in trousers. <laughs> nights of old. <laughs> nights of old in trousers. Can you imagine? <laughs> what you imagine <laughs> saying, pretty night, here's your trousers. <laughs> <laughs> well, they didn't have tights either. Well, breeks. Well, breeks. that's fair no, enough. No. I, think, I think Kenneth has made his point without any... Uh, clarification Rubbish. from me. So, Kenneth, you have a point. 25 seconds left for swashbuckling Ooh. starting now. Well, of course, it's good thing fallen to me to discuss it because they've misled you all. This does not refer to anything except manner. Swashbuckling manner. Oh, would be fire! Uh, Sheila Hancock is challenged. Two manners. Two manners. Swash... A swashbuckling manner. Manners. You said two manners, I'm sure. Oh, I think you did. Shame, yes, I was just getting away. Away. <laughs> I was going to do a big nautical thing. Um, so his big nautical thing came to naught, and um, <laughs> uh, Sheila has another point of the subject back of swashbuckling, and there are 12 seconds left starting now. The reason it has come to mean swaggering and grand now is that if a knight buckled his swash very tightly, he was considered very illustrious because the tight. <laughs> In swashbuckling manner, <laughs> Sheila Hancock was speaking once again when the whistle, whistle, when the whistle <laughs> went. She was swashbuckling when the whistle went. And so she has now gained a lead of one over Clement Freud, who is in second place. And Kenneth Williams and Peter Jones are trailing a little behind them. <laughs> Kenneth, it is your... Don't be so... Because you're in the lead, don't be so nasty. Darling, Sheila. I so seldom win. Let me, let me glory in it. Let me enjoy it. Let her have a moment, Nicholas. Let her have a moment. I think well, she does not. extraordinarily well. <laughs> so, anyway, um, Kenneth Williams, it is your turn to begin. Sir Francis Dashwood. Mm -hmm. Now, I must make quite clear, it is the 18th century Sir Francis Dashwood we wish you to talk about, oh, if you can. <laughs> For 60 seconds, starting now. Well, I don't really know much, but it is laid down in the manual by Thomas Wayne on the subject of the occult that he had this manor house near I Wickham and invited a load of local dignitaries, including the bishop, to see the relaid gardens. And they all got to the top of this tower and he said, now I switch it on and the fountains didn't give water, but milk. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I remember so sorry, I thought he was hesitating and he was, he was sort of saying, give, like yes, that, but he wasn't. Yes, was you it? were very keen, but I'm afraid I disagree with the challenge. So Kenneth has another point, and 30 seconds to continue with Sir Francis Dashwood, starting now. And as the gardens were laid in the shape of a naked woman and this milk come out, <laughs> the bishop was disgusted and Clement. left and said, what a filthy crowd here. <laughs> Repetition of milk. Yes, I'm afraid there was a repetition of the milk. So um, there are 23 seconds left, Clement, for you to continue with Sir Francis Dashwood starting now. In many ways, if it was significant, the holder of England's oldest baronetcy should be the first man publicly to practice black magic, 
which he did in West Wickham in the house about which my colleague Kenneth Williams spoke so eloquently until I buzzed him for repeating himself. Uh, Sheila Hancock, you'll chat. Deviation. He's talking about Kenneth uh, and, and himself. And buzzing and not on... A direct descendant of the Dashwood. <laughs> <laughs> but his buzzing has got no connection with the Hellfire Club. So, Sheila, I agree with your challenge. You have some Francis win Dashwood win. back, you know. Oh, she's going to win. Well, all right. <laughs> Maybe she will. So, Sir Francis Dashwood is back in your court, um, Sheila. And long may you enjoy him. Well, four seconds will do, starting now. They used to come down from the house into the village and take a maiden. <laughs> So, once again, Sheila Hancock was speaking when the whistle went, increasing her lead at the end of that round, and now she has a lead of uh, two over Clement Freud, who's in second place, and Kenneth Williams creeping up a little into third place, and Peter Jones is still in fourth place. Mm -hmm. Sheila, it is your turn to begin. The subject is meteorology. Can you... I managed to pronounce it, too. Can you uh, speak on the subject for 60 seconds, starting now? This is the science of the atmosphere. In other words, it is anything that involves the air and the thing outside. Uh, <laughs> Clement Freud has challenged you first. Hesitation, indeed, I agree. Indeed. So, Clement, you have a point, and the subject, 47 seconds for... 42 seconds for meteorology, starting now. Meteorology, it would appear, is a word that our chairman is traditionally unable to pronounce, except for this instance, when he appeared to have got it correctly. Uh, Kenneth Williams, you challenge. Deviation, we're not discussing the chairman's pronunciation of the word, we're discussing meteorology. <laughs> Now, this is one of those difficult situations. That's a, quite a, a good no, challenge, I, would like I him think. To have it. You would. Because he knows it's justified. That's yes. why. Because he's guilty. He's not red. Look at his face. I'm red. <laughs> have a point. It was 52 seconds before. I misread the clock. It is now 42 seconds for meteorology with you, Kenneth, starting now. Well, of course, the most primitive example of this is your weathercock. Which always blew in various ways when winds prevailed upon it to do so. And thus the old village rustic would say, Ah, tis a northeasterly tonight, or some such rubbish. And people then knew that this wind bringing with it. Oh, uh, Sheila Hancock, <laughs> Repetition of wind. Yes, we've had a bit too much wind, I would say. <laughs> She's rather apt with Kenneth. Yes. <laughs> so, Sheila, I agree with your challenge, and you have the subject back of meteorology, and there are 17 seconds left, starting now. It was first discussed, I believe, by Plato, and later by Aristotle. One person who contributed a lot was Galileo, who invented the thermometer. Uh, Peter Jones's challenge. Uh, hesitation. I would quite agree, Peter. Well, well, listen, well in there. And there are eight seconds for you now with meteorology, Peter, starting now. What a pleasant change it is from the British Museum to visit the Victoria and Albert and see all the meteorites in this... <laughs> at the end of that round, Peter Jones is speaking when the whistle went, so he has leapt forward and is still in fourth place. And... <laughs> That's typical of Peter. <laughs> Kenneth has leapt a little, but is still in third place. Clement stayed the sill and is still in second place, and Sheila moved on progressively uh, like a meteorite with her lead at the end of that round. Conjuring is the subject, and Peter Jones, it is your turn to begin. Can you talk to us about conjuring for just a minute, starting now? It is an entertaining form of uh, magic. Um, Sheila Hancock, you oh, challenge. Oh, sorry. Oh, it's right. Wasn't it? No, he has a... He's, He's only a man. He caught his breath and said it's an entertaining form of magic, and it was beautiful. Well, when I caught me breath with me bad lungs, you said it was hesitation. Just yeah, but he's, he's got no good lungs, you see. All right, all right, please, all let's have decorum. Go on, then. Let's have decorum. Please, let's right. have decorum. Yes. I don't like bad manners. I don't like it. I don't come here to indulge Go in on, Peter. You together. do it. You hesitate as much as you like. No. no. If you hesitate a lot, you better get in, because somebody else will. I right. don't think there was a hesitation there. I definitely think there was only... 
Five seconds gone. I've given you time to think, though, haven't I? Yes. yes. <laughs> now, with a little bit of magic, carry on with your conjuring, Peter, and there are 55 seconds left starting now. And I used to practice it when I was quite a small boy, and I perfected many tricks which I have since done for my own children. They admittedly got rather bored with me when they were nine or ten because they could see how the various tricks worked. Uh, Clement Freud has challenged. Tricks. I'm afraid so, yes. We had more than one trick there, Peter. <laughs> you could have repeated the tricks, you see, with the children, and you ah, repeated yes, them here. Yes. So, there are 40 seconds for you, Clement, with conjuring starting now. If you can keep your head while all around you... Uh, Kenneth Williams has challenged... Repetition. Well. We're always having this. We have it every <laughs> <laughs> Never all rubbish. He just resorts to it at every junk. <laughs> well, <Nicholas. laughs> and it's not good enough, Nicholas. Never. It's not good enough. I'm not good enough. <laughs> Listen, this same old muck about if you can keep yours when all around are losing theirs, and it's all a load, a load of rubbish. Well, I will say this, Kenneth, they all, you all have your different ploys of playing for time, and you've, you've done never heard me come out with all that rubbish about when all around are no, losing No, you come theirs. out with different rubbish and very entertaining. <laughs> You have your little ploys, which we all enjoy. We wouldn't want you to change, Kenneth. Don't misunderstand me. But who gets the point, then? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to ask the audience to be the final judge here, because... Uh, uh, What's Clement... the challenge? What is the challenge, yes? Repetition. What? A, uh, what? Of this endless quotation. We're always here, <laughs> if you can keep yours. Well, keep he has your an watch. And incidentally, who keeps losing it all the time? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Kenneth, actually, to be perfectly fair, he hasn't said it in this particular programme or in this particular round uh, yet. And so anyway, it's a quotation from Rudyard Kipling. The subject is conjuring, therefore it's deviation. Well, he's so made I it. get the subject now. Come on, give it no. to me. <laughs> Come on, give it to me. Give it to me. You might win it in a moment, but I think, to be fair, he hasn't yet deviated from conjuring because he actually oh, hasn't even started. All the way from Cloth Cloth. It's amazing. I'm keeping my tongue. We'll give you a bus fare back, Kenneth. There are 37 seconds for Clement Freud to continue on conjuring, starting now. Are pulling rabbits out of their inside pockets. Then you, my child, will be a man. <laughs> it's the sort of poem that was not written by Rudyard Kipling, but a simple observation made on the stage of the Alhambra Theatre in Reading to a packed audience intent on witnessing a conjuring. Uh, Peter Jones, you challenge why? No Alhambra Theatre in Reading. <laughs> I mean, that you've got to call this fellow's bluff on occasions. He does it with such aplomb, you know. He goes on. We, we're all laughing at this um, misquotation from Rudyard Kipling, which he cleverly twisted back. <laughs> Rudyard Kipling did not say it right. Right, Peter, you have a point. And there are 17 and a half seconds conjuring starting now. It was, of course, the Palace Theatre in Reading, the Alhambra. Um, Clement Freud, you chance. No palace there is a prose that there was a Palace Theatre in Reading, because I played there. Well, there was an Alhambra as well. No, yes, there no. wasn't. No. Oh, yes. Well, no, and, uh, mixing well, I'm sorry, square. Clement, we can't go back as far as you, so... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Jones has another point. <laughs> and there are 14 seconds. And 14 seconds for you, Peter, conjuring starting now. There was a famous Alhambra, and I believe still is, in Bradford. Um, and... Sheila Hancock. Deviation. Time. I what? don't think this is to do with conjuring. But he might be going on to say what happened to this famous Alhambra. Were you? Alhambra now, be Bradford. honest, yes, were you? He was, of course he oh, was. Oh, all right, then. Sid, written all over his face. Um, 11 seconds for conjuring Peter starting now. Yeah. And it was there in Bradford that I saw um, a famous Clement Freud prestig... a challenge. I'm, a... I'm afraid Bradford. Bradford, you see, this and is what Bradford happens when you get challenged, yeah, but not in this, uh, I mentioned Bradford before. No, place yes, but Bradford. I'm afraid once you mention Bradford, this oh, is the trouble. When someone challenges you, you have to start again. It's very difficult because you want to mention the place again. All you can mention again is the subject on the card. Oh, I see. So, um, <laughs> I must give it again to Peter. Clement Freud has a point and eight seconds for conjuring starting now. Not only was he wearing a tail suit, but his inside jacket pocket, there was a pigeon. Um, a Sheila Hancock challenge. We've had jacket pocket before. We had pocket oh, yes, before. He produced true. the that rabbit from true. his yes. pocket earlier on. So Sheila, but in well, the Alhambra, which doesn't exist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well tried, clever, but not good enough. Two seconds for you, <laughs> Sheila, on conjuring starting now. My uncle used to swallow razor blades. <laughs> It's getting into a very keen competition because Peter Jones has leapt forward again, this time into third place. Why do you say he's leapt forward? When, when I go up, up forward, you say crept. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's the different ways you do it. Uh, <laughs> But he actually did gain about four points on that round. He did very, very well. 
So he's overtaken you, I'm afraid, and he's oh. in third place now. And he's a little, just only two points behind Clement Freud, who is only two points behind our leader, who is still Sheila Hancock. Clement, it's your turn to begin. The subject, sheep's eyes. Well, that's got a nice reaction from the audience. They want to hear you talk about it, Clement, and you have 60 seconds starting now. If you approach a sheep and gouge out its eyes... Uh, Kenneth Williams, why do you... I don't want to sit here and listen to a load of... <laughs> Decent people come all this way. I want to be there, there from Shropshire. She don't want to sit there and hear about gouging. <laughs> a load of gouging. I mean, it's horrible. No, there's more. Sheila's gone white. Look at her. <laughs> there's, a of, there's a lot of gouging goes on in Shropshire. I can oh. tell. You. <laughs> I come from Shropshire. I've never noticed a lot of gouging any more <laughs> there than anywhere else. No. That's why you had to leave. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Kenny, the thing was, he wasn't deviating from the subject of sheep's eyes, however unpleasant it may have been and however offensive. So he keeps the subject and 55 seconds left, starting now. They are thought to be something of a delicacy. The only difficulty being that when you serve up sheep's eyes to people, they very often don't believe that they are what you said they were. They are frightened that it is some other part of the anatomy. Equally concerned <laughs> with... Williams. With... He said some other part of the anatomy, whereas the eyes are not a part of the anatomy. So it's the I think they are part of the anatomy, aren't they? Of course they're not. They're in the age. <laughs> and isn't that your anatomy? It's part of the anatomy. I've never seen an anatomy without a head, They're I must say. They're in there. They're <laughs> students from the College of Art. <laughs> yes. I'm going to ask the medical students like whether medical they think student. an eye is part of the anatomy. The cranium's not your anatomy, you great fool. What is it well, then? Well, what is it then? That's your head, isn't it? <laughs> but the anatomy I'm... is the body. All right, shall I put it no, to the no, audience? No, no, I can't put it to the audience. I was talking a lot of rubbish. You can't possibly put it to the audience. <laughs> oh, well, thank you very much for being so honest, Kenneth. So what should we do? Give it to Peter Jones, then. I'm I'll very you grateful what. for anything, actually. <laughs> <laughs> the, one yes, is, the one who's in fourth place, actually, is Kenneth Williams. But he's going to... All right, then, Peter Jones, because um, you, you come from Shropshire, and I think that's a very good reason for you to take over the subject <laughs> of sheep's eyes. <laughs> Five seconds left, starting now. And I believe south of the Atlas Mountains, the people there who cook in small tents with charcoal broilers do uh, cook these. Um, Sheila Hancock's child. There was a definite er uh, there. There's a definite er, uh, so that was a hesitation. Yeah. So, Sheila, you've got the subject of sheep's eyes now, and there are 26 seconds left, starting now. When my husband was in the RAF, he was invited by a sheikh to have lunch with him. He sat cross-legged on the ground, and the lunch was served, and amongst it was... Uh, Kenneth Williams, your child. We're just getting a load of procedural rubbish. We're not talking about sheep's eyes at all. This sits cross-legged on the ground. What's that got to do with anything? She's just filling in. So it was a repetition So it was a repetition of lunch, was it? What? It was a repetition of lunch. <laughs> exactly, yes. Oh, that's yes, not of fair. Lunch. He didn't know that. Yeah. I did. I did. I knew I was reserving You're it in my compartment. Sheet. <laughs> <laughs> she like, yeah, she wanted. He wanted to get his laugh from the audience first before he gave his correct challenge. Oh, so, you're siding against me. Good job. I'm winning. Such a row. <laughs> <laughs> you are. You are winning, Sheila. Actually, but I think everybody's had a little Come bit on, of that. I'll fight you. Right. <laughs> it's, it's no. I think it's, it's it's Kenneth's turn to be generous to him. Go so. On. You have 15 seconds, Kenneth, for your throb, and let it go on sheep's eyes, starting now. With the sheep's eyes and the licorice tooth and the strong arms to carry you away, what more beautiful way could you introduce the subject, the look given to you by someone who is fond of <laughs> Well, at the end of that round, Kenneth Williams leapt forward. <laughs> and he's still in fourth place. Oh. <laughs> and I'm afraid that's where he's going to remain, because I've just been told by a producer that it's time to wind up. In other words, we have no more time to play just a minute. So the final score is that Kenneth Williams finished in fourth place after a final leap, but not to overtake Peter Jones, who finished in third place, who did not manage to overtake Clement Freud, who finished in second place, who didn't manage to overtake Sheila Hancock, who got the lead earlier on and kept it right to the end. And by one point, she is this week's winner, Sheila Hancock. <laughs> Thank you.
We do hope you have enjoyed this particular edition of Just a Minute. And from all of us here, goodbye. The chairman of Just a Minute was Nicholas Parsons. The program was devised by Ian Messiter and produced by David Hatch. Kenneth Williams, Clement Freud, Peter Jones and Sheila Hancock in just a minute. And as the minute waltz fades away, here to tell you about it is our chairman, Nicholas Parsons. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed and welcome once again to Just a Minute. And once again I'm going to ask our four contestants to speak, if they can, on some unlikely subject without hesitation, without repetition and without deviating from the subject which is written on the card. And according to how well they do this, they will gain points or their opponents will gain points. And for those of you who may not yet be sure of the game, I think the rest will become obvious as we play it. And Peter Jones, this week we would like to begin with you. And the subject is treachery. Can you talk to us for 60 seconds on treachery starting now? One of the most unpleasant aspects of human nature, of which I suppose everyone is capable at some time or other, my mind goes back to that famous occasion underneath the House of Commons when Guy Fawkes, perhaps better known as Guido Fawkes, was plotting with his other friends with barrels of gunpowder labelled, I believe, but with that name, and um, above, the <laughs> members of Parliament were congregating. It was the 5th of November in, I think, 1670. I'm not exactly <laughs> sure of the date. Kenneth, Clement Freud has challenged you. Why? Deviation. Why? Of historical information. Yes, it wasn't 1670. I'm saying No, it wasn't. No, no you tried to get out it. of it by saying about that time, but I'm afraid it wouldn't do. So uh, I agree with Clement Freud's challenge, so that means he gains a point for the correct challenge. He takes over the subject, which is treachery, and there are 25 seconds left, Clement, starting now. When you're in the middle of talking knowledgeably about some subject, and a hesitation. Hesitation, I quite agree, yes. So, Peter, you get the, uh, the points and the subject back with uh, 20 seconds left for treachery starting now. And there was the other famous occasion when uh, Brutus and Cassius... Uh, Clement Freud's challenge, why? Repetition of occasion. Yes, I'm afraid there was been more than one occasion, oh, Peter. Yes. So I agree with Clement Freud's challenge, so he gains another point for a correct challenge, taking back the subject of treachery, and there are 16 seconds left, Clement, starting now. Comes up to you and buzzes. Oh... What treacherous behaviour is that, my countrymen? Then you and I and all of... Uh, Peter Jones has challenged again. Why? He couldn't have buzzed that, could he? I mean, what do you mean he couldn't have buzzed that? <laughs> what? He said someone comes up to you and buzzes. Didn't he say that? <laughs> I don't know, actually. I was, tr I was someone, getting a message uh, from Ian Messiter about the next subject at the time. Oh, so we weren't paying attention, No, I wasn't paying ah. attention. <laughs> um. So I'll have to ask the audience. What did you say, Clement? I was in the middle of continuing the sentence that I started when I was so wrong. That's right. Interrupted That's what he was doing. I knew it was something. So <laughs> I'm afraid it was a very good try, Peter, but I disagree with the challenge. So Clement gains a point, keeps the subject, and there are eight seconds left, starting now. She wore long, white cami knickers and crept... <laughs> into the crypt of the church, holding a secret in her left What's hand that? and watching carefully. The well, the whistle that didn't go after 60 seconds then should have been blown by Ian Messiter. And I must explain to the listeners the reason he didn't blow it was because the subjects that he has composed this week have all got slightly confused. And he's been writing them, rewriting them while that first round was going on. I was trying to watch him and listen to the contestants. I well, think we've got hesitation, it sorted out now. Then. No, no. Uh, Clement was speaking then where the whistle should have gone. So he gains an extra point. And we go on to the second round. And Sheila Hancock, it's your turn to begin. The subject is my future. Can you talk about my future for 60 seconds starting now? 
This is something to which I look forward with great pleasure because it cannot be worse than my past. I visualize myself as a very old lady living in the country, wandering in my garden, collecting pretty flowers in a basket. Uh, Kenneth Williams has challenged. Why? I've never heard of quitty flowers. I said pretty. I heard you say quitty. Flowers. Well, you're deaf then, because I said pretty. <laughs> well, whether she said pretty or pretty, it's very difficult to keep going under the pressure of three people trying to challenge pressure, you. Pressure? I haven't gone near a trap pressure. <laughs> That's a different kind of pressure. We, it's a fa family show, Kenneth. Come on, steady on. Remember what you always say. No, I, we, I definitely, I thought it sounded like pretty, but even if it didn't, she intended pretty. So I disagree with your challenge, Kenneth. Uh, Sheila has a point, keeps the subject, and there are 44 seconds for my future Sheila starting now. Wearing a straw hat and smiling benignly at passers-by. Also... Uh, Clement Foyle's challenge, why? Deviation. Why? Well, the Street Offences Act. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm in my garden. I'm not on the street, I'm in the garden. Well, she was smiling... And benignly, if you're I'm smiling at passers-by. Benignly. Not well, presumably much. not also in the garden. But yes. having a this, garden that uh, bordered this, on the road, just to leave this the fall, amounts you could have over the fence, couldn't you? The amounts of licentious and suggestive behaviour, and we don't want to... I don't think it would be. Not the way Sheila would do it. She has established that she was... very old. She has established she's a pretty old lady... She's talking about this straw hat, giving him the wink. It's obvious. All the fellas, he's quite right. If at that age it could be interpreted... Yeah, it makes it worse. All the, all the dirty old men, but dirty old women doing it. <laughs> right. If that is what you like, Clement Freud, you stick to your particular taste and we'll stick to ours. If benign old ladies smile at me, I think they are just being charming and benign. So with Sheila, I disagree with the challenge. You have a point. My future, 40, 37 seconds left, starting now. Young people will come and visit me. Uh, Peter Jones is char charged. A repetition one. of people. Yes, we've had more oh. than one people. So, Peter, I agree with your challenge, and you get a point for a great challenge, and there are 35 seconds left for my future starting now. And I can visualize being one of these people on the sidewalk just outside Sheila's <laughs> house when she's a very old lady, and I would be probably trying to pick up one or two of the blooms or blossoms that <laughs> she was Boyle's tossing at. Kevin why? <laughs> Yes, but he was trying to clean it up. He said pick up and he realized how filthy that sounded. <laughs> and we've already established that uh, he, Sheila was not there for the purpose of a pick up when she's an old lady. So I disagree with the challenge. You're making my future sound awful and it was a lovely vision. I, I know, I'm keeping it nice, Sheila. You've tainted, I'm on your it. You've tainted my whole future, the four of you. No, no, I'm keeping it very nice and very beautiful and very Go lovely. On, then. So you're Peter... going to be picked up by me in my straw hat. Go on. <laughs> He's picking up your blooms. Oh, well, that's even worse, isn't it? <laughs> even better. Well, or, or even better, according on your days. Right, Peter, I disagree with the challenge, so you have another point, and you have the subject, my future, with 22 seconds left, starting now. I should be of an even more advanced age than she would be, and I might often retrace my steps past this lovely old cottage and collect old bits of fruit. Uh, Sheila Hancock has challenged one. Well. Repetition of old. <laughs> yes, we're getting a bit too old. We and are, now. yes. So, Sheila, correct challenge, I agree. So you gain a point of the subject. My future, ten seconds left, starting now. These youngsters will sit at my feet while I recount tales of your... Uh, Kenneth Williams has challenge one. I think this is all terribly boring and rubbish. <laughs> I'm bored to tears. I don't know. This However boring it may be, it's still... It is... Door acts, talking to a load of idiot kids. Well, my it, it is still boring. Sheila's future. But surely boring is not an offence in this game, is it? <laughs> I wasn't talking to you. Mind your own business. <laughs> Your chairman is chairman now. Can't like changes the whole picture of the thing. I quite agree, Peter. If boring was a challenge, Peter, it would change the whole complex of the game. It isn't. As long as you keep going on the subject of the car, which Sheila was doing, well, then she's it's going all right. Yes, she was. <laughs> and there are five seconds for her to continue going on my future, Sheila, having gained another point, starting now. I will give them advice as to what to do with their lives and. <laughs> what a God! Those of you who may not gone. know, when the whistle goes, it does tell us that 60 seconds is up, and whoever is speaking at that moment gains the extra point. On this occasion, it was Sheila Hancock, who, at this moment, <laughs> Kenneth, stop playing Making Sheep Size at the audience. We had that sound. <laughs> whoever is speaking... I dread to think what your future will be. It's a good <laughs> time. <laughs> Mary, please play just a minute. At the end of the second round, Sheila Hancock has taken a lead. 
And Kenneth Williams, it's your turn to begin. Uh, all right, we've had Sheila's future. Now we'll have the, we'll, we'll, we'll hear something because we would like to hear you on my past. <laughs> so we're going to get our own back after those challenges. Kenneth, my past. Can you talk on your past? Well, no, sorry, the subject is my past. 60 seconds starting now. Well, this is so full of lurid and eventful accounts that I think... Uh, Peter Jones, why have you challenged? No, I just, uh, my finger slipped on the button. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't, uh... It's a good reason for challenging, but... Uh... It's not in the game, I'm afraid. No, no. And so you're more finished with the boring trivia and minutia. Go on. Perhaps I can be allowed to continue. Yes, I do apologize. You will be allowed to continue, but you've got a point, Ken. It's your first point of this particular show. It should make you very happy. The subject is my past, and there are 53 seconds left starting now. It is most beautifully shown in my album of snapshots, and the earliest one depicts me sitting on a tiny stool and below is a small puddle. <laughs> and people say to me, What's uh, there on the Peter floor? Jones, and I say, <laughs> well, in my nervousness, you see. Yeah, while they were laughing. laughing. <laughs> What's the matter? You hesitated. I didn't at all. Yes, after the puddle, you definitely hesitated. Did I hesitate? <laughs> Did I hesitate? <laughs> there you are. I know. Why they want to hear more about the puddle. That's why they're saying that. But they're not. I've got to be fair. You hesitated after your... I did not. I announced something. And my mother's sitting there. Look at her. She's gone white. She Look probably knows all about that puddle anyway. She does. Yes. I know. She, knows she probably had to mop it up, poor soul. Oh, yes. <laughs> anyway, I disagree. I mean, I agree with the challenge. I disagree with your... You're saying, Kenneth, there are 35 seconds for you, Peter, on my past starting now. I'm well equipped to speak on this subject because, of course, in my case, there's rather more of it. So I will think back over the years to the time just after or just early, I perhaps. Uh, Clement Foy's challenge. Hesitation, repetition of just. A one We've got a list the alone. Alone. No deviation. And a bumble coming out. And a bumble, yes. Bumble and an impediment. I've got one challenge, please, Clement. Well, hesitation. There was no hesitation. I agree if a repetition of just, but there was no hesitation. So Peter Jones has another point, and there are 24 seconds for my past, Peter, starting now. Some years before the... Uh, um, Clement Freud is challenged. Why? Repetition of just early on. <laughs> no, it's too late now. Quite hesitation. Then. No, I it's too late now just, for that as well. <laughs> so it's... Um, <laughs> Jones has another point for incorrect oh, challenge, good. and 20 seconds on my past, Peter, starting now. A few years before the march from um, Jarrah. Sheila Hancock is challenged. Yes. Why? Yes, we've had years before, Peter. Years. This was a correct challenge. It wasn't... So, Sheila, I agree with your challenge. 16 seconds on my past, starting oh, now. I was born in the Isle of Wight, after <laughs> which we moved to King's Cross. My mother and father were publicans. My sister was on the stage, and they decided it might be a good idea to do the same with me, not having any other... Oh, brilliant. 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 On this occasion, Sheila Hancock was speaking when the whistle went, so she gained the extra point and just managed to get a lead over Peter Jones, who previous to that moment was in the lead. He's now in second place, just behind Sheila. Clement Freud, your turn to begin, and the subject is, you've guessed it, my present. No. Can you talk about my present for 60 seconds, starting now? On my birthday, my family clubbed together and gave me the most splendid present. It was a railway train. Not, I ask you to believe, a toy one, but a real, genuine thing made of steel and brass and tin plate with a whistle that hooted and a scream that came out of the machinery at the bottom. Together with this, I tried to purchase an entire crew to service this vehicle, but this became very difficult because British Railways, who are, in a manner of speaking, in charge of all such mobile equipment, decided that there was a go slow on at Chelmsford, while the people in Doncaster were asking for more money and fewer uh, hours. Hancock is challenged. Well. Deviation. 
Why? Well, I can't. It's nothing to do with his present, the fact that they were going slow in Doncaster and all that. No, is it? he was on about what his chance? present. I agree, yes. He's, I mean, I he's, think he's he... talking about what he's going to buy to go with his present. Yes, I think he's got well away what a, res a result of his present, then he was talking about the go slow in Doncaster. I think he got away from the description, the details of the present. So, 15 seconds, Sheila Hancock, my present starting now. I am sitting at a desk. <laughs> 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 Hesitation. Yes, I agree with that hesitation, Clement. So you gain another point and take the subject of my present back again with 13 seconds left starting now. And so I drove it myself. Sheila <laughs> <laughs> uh, Hancock has challenged. Hesitation. Why? Very long pause. No, I don't think he did hesitate no. there. No, he was He's a bit intimidated by... And when Kenneth Williams is sitting beside him making the most revolting faces to the audience, it's jolly difficult to keep going anyway. That's his normal Kenneth. face. Well, it's his normal face. Isn't it? Pull yourself together. <laughs> I'll make a few abnormal faces so we can play... Go slow at Chelmsford's affected me, dear. I've got right off. It's horrific the way you go. Yeah. Go slow at Chelmsford, the national strike at Doncaster. <laughs> so he's still with his locomotive and there are um, nine seconds left for my present, Clem, starting now. Sitting here with Kenneth Williams resting his left cheek on my right shoulder. <laughs> Sort of uh, Peter Jones, your challenge, why? Deviation. It's nothing to do with his presence. No. I quite agree. Peter, you have another oh, point. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I see, of course, my present... He means it's present. deviating for Kenneth to have his cheek on his shoulder, and I agree. Well, I thought it was, yes. yes. Yeah, well, that, that is not within the rules of the game. You mean my present is the meaning my present this particular moment. You're quite right, Clement. Well, he was I didn't talking about it. his locomotive, wasn't he? He though? was, and he very cleverly and very quickly switched to my present meaning, my present moment, which was Kenneth Williams leaning against him. He had us all fooled for a second, including me. Uh, so, Clement, I must take back what I said. You have another point. Four seconds, my present starting now. And this is very pleasant indeed, because I love the man's... At the end of that round, Clement Freud was speaking when the whistle went, so he has leapt forward. He's now equal in the lead alongside Sheila Hancock, and Peter Jones is only just behind them, and Kenneth Williams, with all his faces, is trailing somewhat. <laughs> so, Peter Jones, your turn to begin. The subject is stuff and nonsense. Can you talk to us on that subject for 60 seconds, starting now? I often stuff furniture, or in more uh, often, it's pillows, or I... Uh, Sheila Hancock has challenged I well. don't want the rotten subject, but he did say often twice. And he did hesitate, yes, but I'm afraid we've got to be fair, but in the rules of the game, Sheila, the correct challenge, you'll get in the subject, 55 seconds, stuff and nonsense, starting now. This usually means, as Kenneth would say, a load of rubbish. And he says it very often. I think he should change and say stuff and nonsense every time one of us deviates from the subject. I sometimes stuff cushions, and while I'm doing it, I sing a nonsense rhyme, such as Peter Jack Jones, Spratt why have you challenged? <laughs> nonsense. <laughs> it's one of the words on the card, so she can repeat it. Yes, oh, I yes. Well, well, I walked right into that one. <laughs> <laughs> she was preparing that trap. I didn't go for it. <laughs> <laughs> she does that to you. That's why she wins. Yes. <laughs> and repeat it as often as she likes. Oh, she means. No, no, there is a limit. I mean, if she goes on What's too much. What's the limit? Four times you're allowed the title. No, oh. three times after that. And it depends oh, how it often within the short space of time, yes. too. I have to use a certain amount of discretion well, on that Well, it depends on like whether it's British summertime. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it depends on the leniency of the chairman, the discretion of the time. I disagree with your challenge, Peter, so Sheila gets another point and 35 seconds for stuff and nonsense, Sheila, starting now. Usually what politicians say is what is on the card. At least that's what I think. While I am doing this to these pillows, I, as I um, said... The Peter Jones a challenge, why? The repetition of pillows. Yes, we've no, had I said pillow. cushions, I said cushions. Cushions before. I You're deliberately changed it to pillows. Oh, wait, did you cushions. walk right into that one too, Peter? I'm so sorry. <laughs> Sheila has another point, and there are 23 seconds for stuff and nonsense starting now. Or indeed, bolsters I sometimes do this to, and... Uh, Peter Jones has challenged again. Repetition of sometimes. Yes, sometimes yeah, do this to. one word. Yeah. You oh, can't do it on one oh, word. Oh, but she's done this sometimes, oh, do well, this to. She's said it about three or four times. You could say sometimes, sometimes, sometimes. I think sometimes. he's most ungallant. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think he, she's reached the point of no return on sometimes, yes. and I give the benefit of the doubt to Peter, with 18 seconds left, starting now. And I myself have occasionally pushed the old kapok or feathers or even down into soft furnishings which are littered all over the house and there stand as mute testaments to this industry which I have practiced <laughs> in... <laughs> On 
that occasion, Peter Jones is speaking when the whistle went gained the extra point. I'd love to think Peter Jones's cushions and bolsters and pillows that he stuffs then stand. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder what he's... <laughs> Pretty frightening. Oh, Sheila Hancock has a definite lead at the end of that round, and Clement Freud and Peter Jones are now equal in second place. And <laughs> Sheila Hancock, we've come back to you again. It is your turn to how begin. How lucky you are. How lucky you yes. are. Yes. And how lucky we may be when you hear the subject that he had messages thought of for you. Yes. Women's lib. Oh. <laughs> Can you talk about women's lib, uh, women's lib for 60 seconds <laughs> without hesitation, without repetition, without deviation, without being interrupted, starting now? It is extremely difficult to do justice to this subject in 60 seconds. Most people think it is a business of burning your brazier and going around liberated in that fashion. In fact, it means a great deal more than that. I consider myself to be a liberated woman because I am lucky enough to be in a profession where the wages are equal. Nay, in fact, a woman can eat. Ah! Uh, <laughs> it's all right. Who's doing it? Clement? Hesitation. Hesitation. Yes, I agree, Clement. You gain the subject. 34 <laughs> seconds for women's lib starting now. Basically, the idea of women's liberation is to liberate them from all such things as were imposed upon them by virtue of their femininity. And thus, a fully women's lib lady would be one who dressed, behaved, or in any other way deported herself in exactly the same manner as would one of the opposite sex. And the day that Sheila Hancock arrives wearing Peter Jones glasses, Kenneth... Uh, Kenneth Williams is a Yes, I was very interesting, actually. I was rather interested to see how no, she was going to rubbish. arrive. But, uh, Absolute rubbish. Well, um, before we became embarrassed by watching you arrive at... Kenneth, I agree with the challenge. Five seconds on women's lib, starting now. This is an idea that certain people here have, and it's apropos emancipation, and I say more power to that. <laughs> Kenneth Williams was then speaking when the whistle went, so he gains the extra point, but alas, he's still in fourth place, but also it's his turn to begin. Well, thank goodness. So, Kenneth, the subject for you now is useful hints. Can you give us some in just a minute, starting now? <laughs> well, a very useful hint was given to John Wilkes Booth when he decided to assassinate Lincoln. They said, get out of it by jumping off the stage box onto the stage and thus make your getaway in the hiatus created dramatically. So he did this and broke his ankle in the process <laughs> and gave rise to a very bad taste story whereby the reporter said, apart from that, Mrs. Lincoln, how did you enjoy the play? <laughs> Of course, many uh, people Sheila would Hancock has challenged What's you. What's she on about? It's super, but it's deviation. I mean, he's got right away from the you... hint that was given to Booth, and I don't believe anybody hinted it to him anyway, Kenneth. No, I don't. I I'm think sure since sure. you weren't there, you might as well shut Not your you. brain down. All you do is interfere. You won the game last week. It's a disgrace. She cheats all the time. Of course, somebody gave him the hint. They he said to me, here's the hint, mate. Here's where you do it. He it's a very it good himself, hint. Probably. Well, I think the thing is, Sheila, that I think in that serious situation that John Wilkes Booth was in, I mean, it was a pretty useful hint, wasn't it? Of course it, it was, indeed. <laughs> going on to what Do happened such a row. Afterwards. Well, it was another... Never have had women on this show. <laughs> Never have had women. <laughs> so, so, you were just we... talking about women's liberation just now. Yes, well, I mean, in that field, in that field, <laughs> Emily Pankhurst and Amelia Bloomer, when she promoted her cause Typical and threw her crinoline away while the audience cried, what ho, and walked about in drawers. <laughs> All right. Nice. We're sorry you didn't have women's lib. It would have been for good for you, Kenneth. <laughs> you keep the subject. Useful hints. 35 seconds left. Start now. One that was given to me was when you have a filthy pan, put a little salt on it before washing up, and you will find this will gently raise the burn stain, and thus it will all come sparkling clean again. Ah, I said, oh, no. <laughs> lovely idea. And I really admit that uh, Sheila Hancock's challenge. What? Everything! What? Hesitation, deviation. He but hesitated a bit then, and he was deviating. He hesitated. Great. Hesitated. I only want one chance. Which one is it? Uh, hesitation. No, he didn't hesitate. Ah! Uh -huh. <laughs> no, thank you. Yes. Oh, no, shut up! Shut up! Long drawn out vowel become hesitation when he goes. Ah! <laughs> I call that hesitation. Well, I'm a good old witch there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You had some very useful hints. What to do with your dirty frying pan? Oh, go on, get on, you yes. silly old fool. <laughs> <laughs> He's never cleaned his horse in his life, anyway. Oh, really rude, isn't he? Come on. Please. 
Nine seconds on useful hints, Ken. It's starting now. Another one is to chuck something over your shoulder in the event of a rainy day or of a cold key down the back. Now, I wouldn't put one uh, up. Sheila Hancock, why is your challenge? What? What is it? You do well, I mean, the, the two things aren't connected, I are disagree. They? Kenneth Williams has another point. Oh. <laughs> two seconds left, starting now. Another hint, I say, put your cap in your pocket. <laughs> in the is there, you have a drink. A very tight contest, and it gets rather needled at times because they do, thank goodness, all want to win, which is a marvellous uh, feature. In third place, equal, were Kenneth Williams and Peter Jones. They were a little way behind Clement Freud, who was in second place, who was two points behind this week's winner, who once again was Sheila Hancock. <laughs> We do hope that you've enjoyed this particular edition of Just a Minute. From all of us here, goodbye. The chairman of Just a Minute was Nicholas Parsons. The program was devised by Ian Mester and produced by David Hatch. Kenneth Williams, Clement Freud, Peter Jones and Catherine Whitehorn in just a minute. And as the minute waltz fades away, here to tell you about it is our chairman, Nicholas Parsons. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed and welcome to Just a Minute. And as you have just heard, we are delighted to welcome back Catherine Whitehorn. And... Once again, I'm going to ask all of them to speak for just one minute, if they can, on some unlikely subject without hesitation, without repetition, and without deviating from the subject on the card. And according to how well they do this, they will gain points, or their opponents will gain points. And let us begin the show this week with Kenneth Williams. Oh, nice. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> well, we thought it would be nice to have you begin, Kenneth. And the subject, oh, a wonderful subject yes? for you, what? flamboyancy. Oh. <laughs> Well, it's not a word I'm enormously familiar with, but I have a go. All right, you'll have a go. Thank you very much. You have just a minute in which to talk on flamboyancy starting now. Well, as I understand it, this means to be volatile and very fluent in terms of speech, certainly, but in terms of dress, I would say... Oh, I've repeated myself. <laughs> <laughs> Clement Freud, press his buzzer first and challenge you... Deviation. A deviation, why? He said I've repeated myself, which has nothing to do with flamboyancy. Well, <laughs> actually... <laughs> I think you're being too clever because obviously he did repeat himself. I think he's being very flamboyant to suddenly say I've repeated myself in the middle of a subject on flamboyancy. I thought that was the most flamboyant Not gesture. Not in a lower key. So no I disagree with your challenge and I therefore award a point to Kenneth Williams who keeps the subject. Well, what about his challenge? What, what about awarding a point to him, to Kenneth? He and Kenneth has a point because I disagree with yes. Clement's challenge. And another point, surely, for uh, spotting his own repetition. Oh, yes. What a yes. good idea, Peter. Yes. <laughs> No, I'm afraid I can't give points unless, unless, of course, the audience feel that Kenneth should have an extra point for uh, oh, yes. uh, uh, challenging mm. himself. The, no, they don't. He don't they, they've had their chance. No, it's too late now. It is too late now. You've got to be quicker than that, audience. Uh, Kenneth has only one point, and he keeps the subject, and there are 50 seconds for flamboyancy starting now. Well, of course, one of the most flamboyant was Vivaldian, with that red hair and those incredible robes. Uh, Catherine Whitehorn has challenged why. Well, I think air is, uh, where it's pronounced like that, is entirely irrelevant. It must be a deviation. How dare you comment on my diction? <laughs> How dare It wasn't your diction, it was your pronunciation, actually. But I think Dictions it was... A... to do with your pronunciation, your great nit. Anyone knows that. I think it was a most flamboyant way of describing her, her appearance. And so I disagree with the challenge. You have another oh, point. Uh, oh, I yes. resent being described as a great nit and having you back him up, if that was what I... Oh, no, no I didn't no, mean that. I no, I was meaning the nits no. in the hair. That's what I mean. <laughs> 
He was actually calling me a great nit, and I'm still giving him a point. It shows you how fair I am, Catherine. So there fair we are. the point of lunacy. I think it proves you're a nit. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm a double nit. So, Kenneth, you have another point, and there are 43 seconds for flamboyancy starting now. Bo Brummel, of course, when he used to swank. Clement Freud has challenged your wife. It's a repetition of, of course, the third time in three starts. <laughs> give, it, give him another one. No, you are. No, really it, not. No, it's very sharp, and you're listening me, extraordinarily I mean, well. It's a joke, isn't it? It's a new Clement it's Freud, I agree with your challenge. It's a new Repetition. 41 <laughs> seconds for flamboyancy starting now. Flamboyancy is the sort of characteristic that Kenneth Williams often shows on this program. It is an ability to throw off the normal fetters of life. Take off your socks, remove your shoes. Uh, Catherine White on your challenge, why? Deviation. Socks are not flamboyant. Especially in, you uh, don't know Kenneth Williams socks. I have to say, I don't know Kenneth Williams socks, and I don't mind going to the grave without knowing Kenneth Williams Well, actually, socks. Uh, Catherine, uh, as much as I'd like to agree with you, because you, you haven't played the game for a time, the thing is that when Kenneth Williams takes off his socks, playing just a minute, it, to me, it is one of the most flamboyant, as well as one of the most embarrassing things one could see. So um, that reason I have to disagree with the challenge, give a point to Clement Freud, and there are 26 seconds for flamboyancy starting now. To attend a soiree at the Young Men's Christian Association, wearing a daffodil in one ear, may well be thought to be a sign of flamboyancy, and yet it is no more than a manifestation of proper behavior, because there are societies which believe in this sort of way and encourage uh, Catherine, it. Catherine, my Tom, you Sort of, repeat it. Quite right, Catherine. So, two sort ofs, and you've got in just before the whistle, and there are three seconds for flamboyancy, <laughs> Catherine Whitehorn, starting now. I suppose to use these uh, three Clement seconds. Freud got in there. Hesitation. No, she didn't even get there. <laughs> it was a very flamboyant challenge, which I disagree with, so Catherine has another point, and two seconds for flamboyancy, starting now. Describing the two gentlemen in front of the <laughs> If you don't already know it, whoever is speaking in this game when the whistle goes, the whistle, by the way, tells us that 60 seconds up gets an extra point. On this occasion, it was Catherine Whitehorn who, on her return to the programme at the end of the first round, has a commanding lead of one over Clement Freud and Kenneth Williams. And Peter Jones has yet to score. Clement Freud, it is your turn to begin the next round, and the subject is dogma. Can you talk to us about that for 60 seconds, starting now? It could be said the dogma is the maternal parent of a canine animal. <laughs> Kenneth Williams, my attention. Well, it was debatable. He was trying to work out this phrase. Well, it was a dogma. hesitation, you know. No, he didn't quite hesitate. He, you go slower than that sometimes, Kenneth, and I don't award against mm -hmm. you, so it was very sharp. But no, I'm benefit of the doubt to Clement Freud. He has another point. Clement, you know you hesitated. Why have you gone red? <laughs> He who hesitates is red. Fifty-seven. <laughs> <laughs> serious form of flattery in your two cases. Um, Fifty-seven seconds for dogma. Clement starting now. Dogma are beliefs, and that. Clement, Kenneth Williams. Deviation. Dogma is not dogma. Dogma is. Surely dogma is the plural for dogmum, isn't it? You don't say dogma. <laughs> <laughs> you don't say dogma are. You say dogma is. Do you? I don't know. Yes. You don't say dogma are. Dogma is. I think that is correct. Of course it's I, correct. But colloquially I, I, speaking, I, you do say it. dogma is. Colloquially speaking, yes. That's so, right. uh, as we have to be... The plural of dogma is the same as the singular of dogma, surely. Dogma is are. Is like sheep. Dogma do you mean is. that we've got... I think I'm going to give the benefit of the doubt to Clement Freud. <laughs> <laughs> and 56 seconds left, starting now. I once worked on a radio program during... Can you give still? Catherine Whitehall. Deviation. Quite right, quite right. Brilliant. Yes, brilliant, brilliant. Well, look, we've got to be fair on this. He was getting a bit irritated. Kenneth was so upset because he was speaking colloquially on dogma, and so he tried to intimidate and disturb and frustrate Clement Freud. I think the fairest thing to do is to charge no points. Give Catherine Whitehall a bonus point for a good challenge but keep the subject with Clement Freud with 43 seconds left, dogma starting now. When you have an animal who barks and raises his right foot, preferably the one on the offside, in order... Uh, Kent, the deviation, the subject of dogs has nothing to do with dogma. <laughs> we all know what the word dogma means. It's nothing to do with dogs raising their legs or their right foot. <laughs> 
<laughs> Dog is in the word on the card, and I think Clement was going in a rather strange and devious way to introduce this situation. Yes, well, rep is in the word repellent, but you wouldn't discuss a weekly rep. You were discussing the word repellent. But you could so you if you wished, you see. Rep. That's the whole thing about this No, you escape. must discuss the word, not a part of it. No, you can take the word and interpret it in any way you wish. I don't think, strictly speaking, he had yet deviated from the subject on the card, and we now have 33 seconds still with Clement Dogma starting oh. now. Honor, loyalty, duty, brotherly, courteous, kind, obedient, smiling, thrifty, clean in thought and mind, could well be said to be the dogma of the Boy Scout movement founded by Lord... Uh, I forget his name. Uh, ben Powell. Lord well, hesitation, oh, hesitation, yes. I so, don't know, or has er uh, acquired the status of a word on this program? No, no, definitely not. No, it definitely hasn't. And Baden Pohl has uh, called it up there. Uh, <laughs> has the er uh, acquired the status of a word? <laughs> sending you out, didn't you know? <laughs> it's not unusual for everybody in this program to send me out, Kenneth, and you do it better than anybody else. And if she's doing it, it shows she knows what the program's all about. <laughs> so, Catherine White, on you have a point, and you have 17 seconds for dogma starting now. Hilaire Belloc said that a man was putting up a candle in the hope that he could cross the Atlantic, and that he, Belloc, was putting up another candle in the... Uh, Cle uh, Clement Freud requested by the first. Repetition of Belloc. Yes, I'm afraid there was. Um, ten seconds for Clement to take back dogma starting now. G.K. Chesterton, the well-known friend of Hilaire Belloc, one said many words on the subject of dogma, few of which one should repeat in a program suitable for families, some of whom have come from King's Cross. Clement Freud was speaking when the whistle went, which has taken him into a lead of two over Catherine Whitehorn at the end of the second round. Peter Jones, your turn to begin. The subject mm. is spiders. Can you talk to us about those insects for 60 seconds, starting now? Now, this could be fortunate. It might be a slice of luck, because a few weeks ago, my children were discussing over a rather desultory meal of fish fingers. <laughs> Uh, Catherine White on your challenge, White. What does a deviation towards the fish fingers? I don't see what they've got well, to do with spiders. Well, it was ever this desultory meal of fish fingers. They were obviously discussing the subject of spiders, I presume, because he had established that they were uh, the subject. Yeah, but he could go on about this meal for days, could he? He could, but no, if I'm he not going to the ketchup. No. It's up to you to, to challenge if you think he's I mean, got I, off I, about I, the meal and not about spiders. I don't think he's yet got off the subject of spiders, which is the subject on the card, so I'm afraid I must disagree with no. the challenge. Give a point to Peter, 49 seconds for spiders. Spiders, Peter, starting now. And because it was rather tedious food, I paid more attention to their conversation than I normally do. And they told me that they are not actually animals, nor are they insects. They're something in between on account of the head not being fixed firmly to the abdomen, which makes them an, of a name which I can't actually recall. And the male... Uh, Clement Freud, why do you... Re repetition of actually. Oh, they are being tough, aren't they, today? Yes, he did say actually twice, but I think it's very tough. But I've got to stick to the rules of the game, so Clement, you'll get a point for that. And there are 28 seconds for spiders starting now. I had a landlady who said that if you found a spider in your room, you would have your entire rent repaid. And as a result of this, all tenants who frequented the lady in question took with the matchboxes uh, Peter Jones, you're challenged. Frequent the lady. Yes, a repetition yes. of lady. You're quite right, Peter. You have a point. And there are 13 seconds for spiders starting now. And the male of the species has a very difficult time when he wants to make love to the female because she is quite apt to eat anything moving that comes... <laughs> Well, I'm glad Peter didn't have any time to continue with that particular process, as interesting as it was. Uh, Peter, you really have leapt forward now. You've gone from fourth to third, five points behind our leader, who is still very definitely Clement Freud. <laughs> Kenneth Williams, we're back to you again, and the subject for you is Lady Godiva. Can you... That appeals to the audience, you on Lady Godiva. But, uh, <laughs> 
shocking one. And uh, you didn't look like that. This is for you very much. Uh, anyway, you have uh, just one minute to talk about her uh, starting now. One thing we can say is that she was a chaste lady and rode this horse through the streets, Coventry, with this very beautiful hair cascading down over her naked body and was honoured by all the inhabitants in that city insofar as they did not pry except for one miscreant. Now this is the origin of your peeping Tom business, to which of course many people... Uh, Catherine White, are you challenged why? Well, deviant. I mean, I don't mean so much the peeping Tom thing, which would doubtless be discussed better in the pages of a psychological magazine, but you're now going into the subsequent career of Peeping Tom's and not Lady Godiva herself. But Peeping Tom, he well established, was looking at Lady Godiva. And this is the subject he's on about Lady Godiva. So I don't think he was, strictly speaking, deviating from the subject on the card, Catherine. So I award him another point and he ah. keeps the subject with 23 seconds left starting now. However, she did undoubtedly incur the wrath of Leofric. And when she got back to the castle, he said, what do you want to go gallivanting around like that? <laughs> <laughs> and they one seeing you. And she said, on the contrary, she said, they didn't witness the incident, she said, because they were all indoors and behaving themselves, apart from this peep in Tom. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Clement Freud got in just before the whistle went then. Repetition of peeping Tom. Yes, peeping okay. Tom. What a pity. One second later, and Clement Freud wouldn't have been in, and he has a point for peeping Tom, and one second to go, Clement starting now. Requested... <laughs> Well, alas, um, because um, we wanted you to keep the subject to the end because you'd started and kept going so well with it, Kenneth. Clement got in before the whistle, gained an extra two points there, and still, of course, in the lead. And Clement Freud, your turn to begin. The subject, handicap. Can you talk on that for 60 seconds, starting now? The handicap in the world of equestrian sport is a weight allocated to a horse, which the man in charge of compiling this feels would make the animal in question run equally fast as lesser... <laughs> Kenneth Richards, <laughs> you're getting so confused. Yes. I think you rather saved him, actually. Yes, Kenneth. of course, it's all a point. Um, <laughs> you can see in this game, having started on a sort of train of thought in describing something which doesn't quite make sense, you've got to keep going and try and get out of it. And Clement couldn't quite achieve it on that occasion. He usually does. Um, Kenneth, you have a point, and there are 43 seconds for handicap starting now. Well, mine indeed is a handicap, and I fold it into a half moon, slip it into my raincoat pocket, and thus am prepared for all emergencies. Come rain, come shine, there I am. Str uh, Peter Jones is... <laughs> uh, repetition of come. Come rain or shine, there come I am. Come rain, come, rain, come, come shine. shine. Yes. That's right, yes. And... <laughs> <laughs> Your flamboyance tripped you up, I'm afraid, uh, Kenneth. Uh, Peter, you have a point. 29 seconds for handicap starting now. It can be a very heavy weight carried on the back, and jogging up a hill, it can make one... Uh, two cans, you said. Two cans, <laughs> I must uh, explain to the listeners, the audience are clapping because they're all slinting their eyes now to see how sharp they can be with each other. And uh, Kenneth was the sharpest on that occasion. He gains another point and there are 22 seconds for handicap starting now. The only trouble is when the proofing of the material goes off. Now, be uh, Clement Freud has challenged you. Repetition. What? Words. Words? Yeah, they're all words. <laughs> Yes, but you see, he didn't repeat the word, word. And you can't play this game without repeating words. Can't you? No. <laughs> he does haven't pretty you, well. Haven't though. you discovered that, Clement? Don't be so <laughs> witless and stupid. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wouldn't worry, hey, Kenneth. You've got another point oh, for a rank. Oh, yes, for oh, false challenge. And you have 14 and a half seconds for handicap starting now. Well, of course, there is another kind of handicap, and this is always used in golf terms. And they get on those greens, you know, and throw those balls about into bunkers and canals and terrible. I don't know whether 
that last bit was about, Ken, but you completely inhibited the other three in Chanji. You were supposed to be Carol Channing, didn't you know? <laughs> yeah, but you were completely... You were talking about throwing <laughs> balls into that. bunkers. They don't. They hit them. You and that's how golfers throw them everywhere. Have you ever tried it? <laughs> oh, oh gracious. Yeah. Anyway, Kenneth, at the end of that round, you have leapt from fourth place into second place, but you're behind Clement Freud, who's still very definitely in the lead. Um, Catherine Whitehorn, your turn to begin. The subject, red tape. Can you talk to us on that for just a minute, starting now? If blue tape is the kind of tape that you tie up... That, oh. uh, Kenneth Williams is a challenge. Yes, the subject is red tape, so we don't want to discuss blue. <laughs> Yes, but she didn't have a chance to get going, did she? I and she was going... as well. Yeah, that's too late. Your challenge was uh, was yeah. deviation, and I think she was about to do a comparison with red tape, so I'm going to give the benefit of the doubt to Catherine. She has 55 seconds to continue with red tape, Catherine, starting now. And pink... Uh, Ken, uh, Clement Freud is challenged. Hesitation. Yes, there was a hesitation, but she was thrown off by Kenneth's last challenge, so I'm not going to allow it. Would and you care to allocate breathing time on this programme? You don't get any I'm afraid you, you, don't, get, in, you now, don't get any quarter. <laughs> they don't get any quarter. With you have your gulp, purveyor, while he's giving you the clue. There's no sense of... <laughs> wheezing noises you will hear from now on. <laughs> Catherine, take your breath and I will say, um, no, I'll do it this way. I'll say there are... Hurry up! Breathe out, breathe out. I'll do it this way. There are 54 seconds for you, Catherine Whitehorn, on red tape. Take a breath, starting now. <laughs> <laughs> There are 53 seconds for you, Catherine Whitehorn. Take a breath, red tape, starting now. Pink ribbons are what you tie up the photographs of the little girls that your grandmother thinks are very sweet. Blue tape are the things that you tie up the letters from your boyfriends. Clement Freud is challenged. Repetition of tie-up. Yes, I'm afraid we've had more than one tie-up. Yes. Oh. So, uh, Clement, this time is a correct challenge, and there are 45 seconds for red tape starting now. It is generally believed that the reason why red tape is called red tape is that because it was used to be tied around official documents such as briefs or government papers. And they, of course, are the people who spend most time waffling or, to put it your way, indulging in red tape. A man I know who lives in chambers, which is another way <laughs> of saying that his residence is in the Inns of Court, London WC2, makes most of his money by Collecting. Uh, Kenneth Williams, Michael Chan. Yes, yes, he was. He was getting to the point of a. Uh, 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 Nod in there. green. <laughs> <laughs> Eight seconds with you on red tape, uh, Kenneth, starting now. This is usually done with sealing wax, and as it drops onto the paper, you bang a great seal on it, and it's lovely to look at. It's <laughs> At the end of that round, Kenneth Williams is speaking when the whistle went. He has gained that extra point for doing so. At the end of that round, Clement is still in the lead. Kenneth is now definitely in second place, and Peter Jones and Catherine Whitehorn are just about equal, just behind Kenneth Williams in third place. And Peter Jones, your turn to begin. <coughs> Introductions. Can you talk to us about that for 60 seconds, starting now? These are something that we're generally believed to be not quite so good at here in England, and I, of course, include in Britain, Scotland, Ireland, and Wales, as they are over the Atlantic in America, where they are really excellent at this kind of social gesture. Uh, it, Kenneth Williams, a challenger. Deviation is completely untrue. The English was successful at introducing people as anybody else in the world. <laughs> <laughs> Whether no, no, no. you think that or not, you're allowed to think whatever you I'm like in this game. I disagree with your challenge. Peter Jones you know, has another know, point, you know. and there are 43 seconds left starting now. How often has one been invited to a party and stood just in... Uh, Kenneth Williams... Deviation, I'm not often invited to a party. <laughs> Luck for you, Kenneth Williams. Peter Jones has got another point. Well, you should say how often I've been. He said how often one is. I'm He's not. still not deviating from the subject of introduction. Well, only one is. Not many. One. One, yes. <laughs> uh, Peter, you have another point, and there are 37 mm -hmm. seconds. points like mad, a blue-eyed boy this week, is. <laughs> <laughs> 37 seconds for introduction starting now. And once inside the door, one stands on the threshold of a huge room being held by the hand by the hostess, who's shaky and okay, nervous, well, by the, by the, twice. All right, by the, by the, all right. This time you've uh, sharp... 
uh, ears have got another point for you, Kenneth Williams, and there are 29 seconds for introductions starting now. Well, the perfect way to do this is, of course, you know who this is. When they say no, you say Muriel, and they're forced immediately. Uh, Peter Jones, why? His name isn't Muriel. <laughs> He challenged me when I said one is invited to a party, and now he's uh, trying to pretend that he's Muriel. <laughs> My friend Muriel is not going to like it at all. All right. <laughs> Peter Jones has a, has a point for Muriel, and Kenneth Williams also has a point for an incorrect challenge, and he keeps the subject, and there are 18 seconds for introduction starting now. And the other way to do it is to say, do you recall the occasion on that very, very hot and lovely... Uh, Clement Freud's challenge. Repetition of Barry. Yes, very sharp there. Oh. Two Barry's, Clement Freud, repetition. You've gained a point. Eleven seconds. Introduction starting now. I have felt that the best way to introduce people whom you don't know is to turn to one of them and say, I'm terribly sorry, I can't remember your other name. At which the person says, Smith. And you say, well, of course, I knew that. <laughs> Floyd was speaking when the whistle went, so he gained the extra point. And I'm afraid we have no more time, so I must give you now the, the score at the end of what was the final round. And as you uh, probably guess, Catherine Whitehorn came just in fourth place. She was leading almost at one time. And she was a few points behind Kenneth Williams in second place, behind this week's undoubted winner, Clement Freud. <laughs> Hope that you enjoyed this particular edition of Just a Minute. From all of us here, goodbye. The chairman of Just a Minute was Nicholas Parsons. The program was devised by Ian Messiter and produced by David Hatch. Present Kenneth Williams, Clement Freud, Peter Jones, and Catherine Whitehorn in just a minute. And as the minute waltz fades away, here to tell you about it is our chairman, Nicholas Parsons. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, and welcome once again to Just a Minute. And once again, we welcome back the same four keen competitors of Just a Minute, who I'm going to ask to speak, if they can, for Just a Minute, on some unlikely subject, without hesitation, without repetition, and without deviating from the subject on the card. And according to how well they do this, they will gain points, or their opponents will gain points. And let us begin the show this week with Clement Freud. Clement, the subject for you, Essentials. Can you talk on that for just one minute, starting now? Colloquially, if you are caught without your essentials, it might well mean, if you are a man, that you have forgotten... Uh, Kenneth Williams. Two ifs. <laughs> <laughs> right at the beginning of a new game that is as sharp as anything, well, we don't usually allow such little challenges as that. I see. Fair enough. Well, but I'll wave I'll it. What, I'll no. wave it. Fair no, enough. No, no. I'll tell no, you what you're we'll very do. Good chairman. We'll give you a point for a correct challenge, because it was a correct one. I wouldn't accept charity if I were you. <laughs> <laughs> you're too so good. He's not Jared, he's got a challenge, which is correct, so well, I must win the rules of the game, anyway, give him a point. With a 50 seconds for you on essentials, <laughs> Kenneth, starting now. Well, of course, systole and diastole would be described as absolutely essential to the human body, and in case any of you are ignorant about these words, I will explain them mean the contraction and the outward action of the pumping of the human heart. It has been associated so often with romantic ideas in poetry and in medicine with the essential business. Oh, no. uh, Catherine might on a challenge you. Why? Well, as a matter of fact, it's a mistake, but still, I, I'll try and back that up by suggesting that to go off into the romantic... Uh, I said the romantic, and then I said any medicine with the reservoirs of the blood. 
I think he established, even though we thought it was very well, some talking, that, um, <laughs> that he did establish that it was essential to the working of the human body. And so um, I think we must give him another point, Catherine, and say he has uh, 17 seconds on essentials. Can it starting now? The others, of course, are the seven secretive glands. Uh, Clement Freud is challenged. Repetition of of course. Yes, so you had if, so I'm going to give Clement of course. And uh, <laughs> he has a point for a correct challenge, Clement, 15 seconds on essentials starting now. A flautist without a flute, a pianist. Uh, Peter Jones, a challenge. Why? No, hesitation. I think so, yes. Only just, but uh, benefit of the doubt to you, Peter. 11 seconds essential starting now. I suppose Roy Plumley would consider that a gramophone and a number of records would be essential to him if he were taking a flute. <laughs> The whistle, which is so elegantly blown for us by Ian Messiter, who thought of the game, tells us that 60 seconds is up, and whoever is speaking at that particular moment gains the extra point. On this occasion, it was Peter Jones, who is equal in the lead with two points alongside Kenneth Williams at the end of the first round. And uh, Catherine Whitehorn, it is your turn to begin. The subject, oysters. <clears throat> Can you talk to us about them for 60 seconds, starting now? What noise annoys an oyster most is presumably the sound of a squeezed lemon falling upon its prostrate form as the shell lies open in front of the diner. There are other heights of decimal frenzy which might also disturb this interesting mollusk, such as the sound of a keel scraping along the top of its bed, which might perhaps be enough to upset any of us. And in the case of <laughs> Peter Jones' challenge, why? No, hesitation, I thought. Oh, why do you mean you thought? Thought? Hesitation, you should be slow, but there was no hesitation. <laughs> <laughs> She was, was very slow. I think she had reached the point of slowness when I think you could interpret it as hesitation. No, I, I thought it was quite It was hypnotic. very clever, actually, because she got slower hypnotic. and slower and slower. You hypnotic. didn't really know whether she was hesitating well, or not. Well, it was always thinking about oysters. They're not Dr. exactly Mesmer. a racing. I was quite mesmerised myself. I was really you go into feeling for those little trunk. mollusks. Um, no, I think I must uh, allow Peter Jones his hesitation. Aye? And so you have a point, Peter. <laughs> and 25 seconds for oysters starting now. I think one of the nicest foods is the oyster, and if you are going on a picnic, I advise you to go to New South Wales and get a boat and go up the river from Sydney, where... Uh, Kenneth Williams has challenged This one. is a travel itinerary and has very little to do with oysters. <laughs> but in my mind, he was, he was going to make it quite clear that in this little boat he was going up the river... And How do you know you're not in his mind? You don't know where he was going to go. <laughs> Do you think well, you've got I've a got... crystal ball up there in which you can tell what everyone's doing next? Well, in that case, Kenneth, you could challenge after every two words and say deviation, because oh, he hasn't got the subject. Yes. Oh, I stand corrected. Oh, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> Thank goodness you back down very gracefully and rapidly on occasions, Kenneth. Um, Peter Jones has another point, and there are 13 seconds for oysters starting now. And there, as you sail up the Hawkesbury, you will find lots of little coves where attached to the rocks are the most delicious oysters you've ever imagined. You can make a campfire. <laughs> A very loud whistle which was blown was still blown by ear messenger. It's all a load of lies. They're not attached to rocks at all. They're in bed. Why don't you challenge him? Why don't you challenge him then? Well, because you said all right. It all comes to an end. The whistle's blown. It's all lovely. You were going. Well, the whistle has blown. You didn't challenge him before the whistle. They're rock got oysters. <laughs> <laughs> They're rock oysters. They are attached. Anyway, uh, Peter Jones <laughs> was speaking when the whistle went without a challenge beforehand, so he gained that extra point. He now has a very definite lead. He has five points, in fact, and Kenneth is in second place with two. And uh, Peter Jones, <laughs> it's your turn to begin. The subject, pears. Remember, it's the word on the card, not the spelling. <laughs> And you have 60 seconds starting now. Still on the subject of food. Well, that's one of my favorite desserts. Delicious, ripe, firm pears, perhaps served in a basket. Uh, Clement Freud has challenged. Why? Deviation. Why? Well, if they're ripe, they're not firm. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a very good challenge. It's very debatable because often people say that... No, uh, believe me, there is about 20 minutes in the life of a pear when it is both ripe and <laughs> firm. <laughs> <laughs> you took the very words out of my mouth, Peter. I think that's a very apt description of the situation, so I award you the point for 
And 50 seconds per pair starting now. In a basket with a napkin. And if they are overripe or if they are not even... Uh, Clement Freud has challenged. Repetition of right. Yes, you had right before. Very definitely, we've had a discussion. So, Clement, I agree with your challenge. You have a point. And 44 seconds for pears starting now. If you were to take some pears and whittle away at them with a knife, then it could rightly be said that here is a man who pears pears. <laughs> and if you had two of these fruit, then one might recall that there... Uh, Peter Jones has challenged. Why? Repetition. He said two fruit. <laughs> How did you mean two? <laughs> he said that you had two. Oh, I see a repetition in that sense. Yes, yes. there were two, so it's repetitious. <laughs> but, but, you see, a pear is two, and so as it's on the card, you but could not have But he didn't actually say a pair of pears. He said two pears. Yes, mm -hmm. but he has not deviated from the subject on the card, which is pears, and two is a pear. So on every reason... <laughs> <laughs> yes, I see. So, um... Like um you really uh, won on the technicality. <laughs> Oh, it's a very difficult job being chairman, I can assure you, especially when everybody wants to impress upon the chairman that their point of view is the right one. And there are 26 seconds for Clement Freud to continue with pairs starting now. To put it another way, he who purchases a brace of these things um, would be sick uh, Kenneth to pair uh, Yes, home. yes, he'd, he'd managed to find another word mm. and was so delighted with it and we were so impressed that then Kenneth came in with a challenge. Uh, 19 seconds now, Kenneth, on Pear, starting now. Well, of course, the most famous is Pear Elaine. And indeed, when she thought... Uh, Catherine Whitehorn, wife who challenged? Because there's no such dish as Pear Elaine. It is Poir Elaine or Pear Helen. Yes, on the contrary, you should read Fowler's modern English usage, dear, in which he says to actually pronounce the foreign word in its own sounding, you make your interlocutor even more embarrassed than the acrobatic feat you're committing with your own mouth. And if it's good enough for Fowler, it's good enough for me. I know. Well, setting all that at one side, what about this one? I'm two sentences back. You go around saying cul de sac. No, you say cul de sac like everybody else. We don't say Paris. We say we're going to Paris. And don't come and come the acid with all this French rubbish. <laughs> That was very, very well expressed, but I do think here you either say Poir Helene or I Pear say Pear Helene. Helene and the waiter gets it for me. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> are you trying to paint me as an ignorant slob? No! <laughs> You've just proved that you're not. It was a most interesting dissertation. I'm sorry it wasn't in the game, actually, but, but I think uh, Catherine had a very good challenge because, after all, we have to be very keen. We're all pretty sharp, and so I'm going to award a point to her, and she takes over the subject of pears, and there are 14 seconds left starting now. Now. Harry. <laughs> Peter Jones has challenged you. Uh, hesitation. Peter, you have a point, and there are 12 seconds for pair starting now. There are certain seasons in the year when friends give one great piles of hard, unripe pears, and the thing... <laughs> Clement Ford has challenged. Repetition of ripe. <laughs> oh, this is unripe. <laughs> this is a recording. This is unripe, I said. Well, unripe is one word, and ripe is another. Well, that's what I say. That's I right. Well, Peter, you have another point, and there are four seconds. <laughs> Four, starting now. And you stew them in red wine and serve them, if you like, with a mild cream cheese. Well, at the end of that round, Peter Jones was again speaking when the whistle went, and he really is forging ahead and showing he now knows the game. Kenneth Williams, your turn to begin. Oh, thank goodness. <laughs> we heard quite a lot from you in the last round. It wasn't in the Only game. Only in protest. It was beautifully Defense protested. Against injustice and wickedness. Well, <laughs> here's a good subject for you then. Fright. Oh. <laughs> Can you talk to us about fright for 60 seconds, uh, Kenneth, starting now? I was once sitting in a basha, which is the name for a conventional type bungalow in Ceylon, typing a rather interesting letter, and I heard a sort of swishing noise. <laughs> I imagined it to be paper blowing along the floor. Looking, though, I saw a snake. I didn't realise that it was dangerous and called out, help, help. <laughs> <laughs> He 
Freudian joke before. <laughs> Clever would Freud challenge you first? Anyway, Mac Marling officer came in with a revolver and shot it. <laughs> it's a pity he didn't come after the first help or you'd still be in the game. <laughs> Clement, do you have a point for a correct challenge? For the 30 seconds for fright starting now. One of the easiest ways to be frightened is to go to Ceylon and sit in a small bungalow. <laughs> waiting. Uh, can this just... is disgraceful and you know it. It's just a pity. I'm allowed to be abused in this fashion, first by that lady with that pronunciation, now pinching every bit of my script, pinching it out of my mouth. Well, we, the thing is, uh, when you are stuck, when you are so clever that you can just go spontaneously like you did, you, and you have to think of things as spur of the moment, you often have to take over somebody else's, which Clement did. It's a great compliment to you that he couldn't be more spontaneous at that particular moment. So, as he has not used those words before, there are 20 seconds for Clement, having gained another point on fright starting now. <laughs> It was a dark and stormy night, and the waves were as big as houses on the outskirts of Madagascar's capital city. And yet I, in a small boat on the North Sea, tried desperately to overcome the water that was warning... Uh, Catherine White on your channel. Well, it just struck me you must have deviated a good way from Madagascar if he got to the, lo the North didn't Sea. Say I didn't say Madagascar. No, 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 he was trying to describe it. He did sort of go around the houses a bit, no, but he definitely was on the sea, and so it was quite natural the water should have been up there. Oh, well, forgive houses. me for not following you. I know, it's very difficult. Well, I quite agree, Catherine. I think he was saying that the, the, the waves about the high as these houses near Madagascar, which just was confusing. But he didn't deviate from fright, and there are four seconds left for it, Clement, starting now. At 13,500 feet, the pilot turned to me. <laughs> well, Cameron Foy gained a number of points in that round, including taking one when the whistle went, so he's crept up on Peter Jones. And Clement Freud, it is your turn to begin. The subject is affection. A subject a great deal of which has been shown at different times in this program. <laughs> and a lack of it on occasions as well. But would you talk about it for 60 seconds, Clement, starting now? If a man were to come up to you with jack boots and spurs and strike you about the face and body with a whip, it would be a very lukewarm reason for saying, there goes affection. One would be more correct to state, what a swine because affection is love. Affection is when some good friend like Kenneth Williams in a white shirt, faintly tarnished with perspiration marks beneath it, <laughs> embraces you even as his nose twitches to show that for him there's no one else except his mother and various other friends whom he holds more dear. Once on a daybed in Exeter College, Oxford, a woman called Gladys bared herself and put both arms around me, saying, you are the one. Clement Freud, make me happy. Well, I'm glad that perhaps there's a good thing the whistle went because we wouldn't go <laughs> any further on what happened on that day bed in, uh, where was it? Exeter you, College. Exeter Oxford. College. You do see that uh, Kevin Freud does lead a rather bizarre life. And um, he gave the only points on that round, starting and finishing with the subject. And um, it is uh, Catherine Whitehorn's turn to begin. Catherine, the subject is sin. Can you talk to us on sin for 60 seconds, starting now? The seven deadly sins, as outlined in medieval mythology, comprised those things which they did not want to do and which we now do. In some cases, this can be having a girl bear herself to you on a daybed in Exeter College, Oxford. In some cases, it can be to sniff the sight... <laughs> Peter Jones' is challenge. Uh, hesitation. Yes, I agree. Well, wouldn't you hesitate in the circumstances? Yes, I would. <laughs> yes, she was even hesitating, trying to remember what he said. Uh, Peter, I agree with the challenge, so you gain a point, and there are 37 seconds for sin. Start oh, that's a nice... Not much. <laughs> <laughs> Can you sin in 37 seconds? That's a good point. Um, 37 seconds, Peter, starting now. Uh, just to give them a name, let us recall that they are pride, covetousness, lust, anger, gluttony, envy, sloth, 
hesitation, deviation, and repetition. <laughs> Let us not fall into the trap. Uh, Clement Floyd has challenged why? Repetition of letters. Yes. Yes, too. Oh, let us remind ourselves and let us not. Sharp challenging, but it's neck and neck at the head of the game. Well, it's so... neck and neck. It's either repetition or it's not. <laughs> <laughs> it is both neck and neck and repetition, Kenneth. So don't be facetious. 20 seconds for sin, Clement, with you starting now. In the game of ice hockey, they have a very interesting thing which is called a sin bin. In other words, when a player has committed an offence known in the trade as sin, he's... Uh, Kenneth Williams a challenge. Why? You're talking about ice hockey. Then is it known in the trade? And ice hockey is not a trade. Yes, it is. <laughs> well, it can be. It is again this colloquialism that comes in. And I say colloquially speaking, most people might refer to it as a trade. Some no, people you talk refer about... to ice hockey as trade, do you? No, I don't. <laughs> but Clement Freud does. All right, if you known want to debate it, trade, I will put doesn't... it to the audience. Mm. Do you think, uh, colloquially speaking, it could be? But let you be the final judges. If you agree with uh, Kenneth Williams' challenge, will you cheer? Right. And if you disagree, will you boo? And you all do it together now. Hooray. The booze have it, Kenneth Clement Floyd. Clement, you disagree I thought the me. chairs had it. You think the chairs had it? I Thank you very much. I'm glad you're sporting. Uh, so, Clement will. Clement. <laughs> Kenneth, the audience are on your side and you have a point because it's not a trade, and there are ten seconds for sin with you now starting. Now. As Oscar Wilde properly remarked, the only real sin is stupidity. And every time I come upon it, I pronounce it most of it. Well, at the end of that round, Keith Williams was speaking when the whistle went, so he gained the extra point. But Clemens so I'm winning. No, you're still <laughs> very definitely in third place. Clemmer Freud and Peter Jones are still way out in the lead. And Peter Jones, it's your turn to begin. And from sin, we go to goodness. Can you talk about goodness for 60 seconds, starting now? This delightful quality is, I suspect, not perhaps quite as popular or as fashionable as it once was. Though I believe that there's still a great deal of it about. This is uh, Kenneth Williams' wife who challenged. Well, he's talking about a rubbish. Goodness is a fundamental quality, therefore it can either be fashionable or unfashionable. Oh, I think goodness can be fashionable and unfashionable. Nonsense. It's a fundamental quality. Truth, goodness and beauty are fundamentals. They're neither in fashion or out of fashion. Oh, definitely. A lie would be a lie in Babylon or London, you great idiot. Don't you know that? <laughs> I'm talking about it being fashionable or unfashionable. I love the way you speak to me sometimes. Oh, I don't mean so rude, really. I assure you. It's and if you think of your restoration comedies, they often say such and such is very much in fashion. I'm you can use speaking. it in that expression. And you can talk of it in the way that people... No, what he it. meant was the practicing of goodness was out I don't of fashion. Mind what he, he didn't meant. say that. He said goodness itself was out of fashion, which is rubbish. Yeah, the We've word. got loads of wonderful goodness. people all around us, good people, fine people, people giving themselves, laying down their lives. And how do you know he wasn't referring to the word goodness being out of fashion? Either way, I think uh, Peter Jones has a point with 45 seconds left starting now. This is supported by the fact that advertisers use the word a great deal. It must carry a lot of emotional weight. That is why they refer to something as having locked in goodness or goodness added or some kind of word of that kind. Uh, Clement Freud, why have you chatted? Repetition of word. Yes, you did say that goodness was a... Um, did I? Oh. That's right. So, Clement, you have another point for a correct challenge. 27 seconds on goodness starting now. Take an elderly woman down at heel and poor with her bent back <laughs> and then along comes a man balding of middle age, who puts his hand into his pocket, withdraws five crisp pound notes, and says, here you are, this is to purchase a cheese sandwich and wine <laughs> to go with it. Now there... My goodness, he took a long time to get to his touch of goodness, didn't he? He so painted the picture, we were all paralysed for a minute. Clement Freud, you were speaking when the whistle went, you gained that extra point, and you've increased your lead over Peter Jones at the end of that round. Kenneth, the subject for you, which I'm sure you can talk about well about, because I hope you've had many experiences of it, embarrassments. Can you tell us about some embarrassments in 60 seconds, starting now? Well, there was an occasion in a play called 
Hotel Paradiso, the Wind Garden Theatre, when I had to appear through these French windows, and I did do this, and unknowingly had failed to fasten the fly. And the other actor stood in front of me. I thought selfishly, rudely, throughout the entire scene. When I got into the wings, I asked why he had obstructed me, and he said, because your flies were open. I realized then uh, how Peter Pauline Jones' was challenge, what? A repetition of flies. Yes, no, I said fly first, and fly is the second. So anyway. He said fly. <laughs> That's right, yes. Yeah, so. Of course it's right. I know what I'm talking about. Don't worry, it was my flies were open, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. So I'll give it to you in a minute. Um, oh. 24 seconds on flies. I'm sorry. I'm... <laughs> 24 seconds on embarrassments starting now. And Joni Sims always says that her most embarrassing one was when the gun didn't go off and she was forced to kick him in the behind and he staggered to the floats and said the boot was poisoned because he had to die somehow. You You're a rotten ass, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it was challenged. Oh. Deviation. <laughs> yes, why? Nothing to do with embarrassment. Of course, it's extremely embarrassing to be kicked up the behind and have to stagger to the floats and say it's poison. <laughs> and it's very embarrassing to have a rotten house when you tell a very funny story. Precisely, so... thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Oh, he's <laughs> so, kiss it down, Kenneth. You've got to continue in a minute. <laughs> you have eight seconds for embarrassments, Kenneth, starting now. The other one was when they went up to the Archbishop of Canterbury and said, every word is a hymn to your grace, because they really meant it as a popular lyric, you see, but each of the Well, at the end of that round, Kenneth Williams was speaking when the whistle went, so he gained the extra point. And I'm afraid we have no more time, so I must give you now the, the score at the end of what was the final round. And as you uh, probably guess, Catherine Whitehorn came in fourth place. She was a few points behind Kenneth Williams, who was quite a few points behind Peter Jones, who was just behind this week's winner, Clement Freud. <laughs> Hope that you enjoyed this particular edition of Just a Minute, and from all of us here, goodbye. The chairman of Just a Minute was Nicholas Parsons. The program was devised by Ian Messiter and produced by David Hatch. Kenneth Williams, Clement Freud, Peter Jones and Amy MacDonald in just a minute. And as the minute waltz fades away, here to tell you about it is our chairman, Nicholas Parsons. Thank you very much indeed. Welcome once again to just a minute. And uh, once again, we're delighted to welcome back Amy MacDonald to... Uh, pit her feminine wiles against our three tough male exponents of the game. And I'm going to ask them to speak once more, if they can, for just one minute on some unlikely subject, without hesitation, without repetition, and without deviating from the subject on the card. And according to how well they do this, or otherwise, they will gain points, or their opponents will. And we'll begin the show this week with Amy MacDonald. How to live to be a hundred years old. <laughs> can you talk on that subject for just one minute, starting now? Well, you should know about that better than Someone I has do. challenged you before you've even started, Clement Freud. Why? I was being gallantly chivalrous. <laughs> <laughs> and because I disagree with your challenge, Amy McDonald gains a point, and that shows Clement Thank Freud. You. To... 
It is. <laughs> and before we, we've only gone two seconds, and Amy McDonald has one point. Amy, the subject is still how to live to be 100 years old, starting now. I think if you want to live to be 100 years old, you have to be very careful about things like food and sleep. You have to eat all the right things, and you have to go to bed early and get up early. You know the old saying, early to bed, early to rise. Makes a man healthy, wealthy, and wise, and I suppose very old, too. Because if you do all that, you see, then you obviously have a lot of time to regenerate yourself and make things a little easier, and therefore life becomes a lot easier and very simpler to live, you see. Um, Peter Jones is challenged. Why? Uh, repetition of easier. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. yes it could have been <laughs> Why did you wait till then, Peter? <laughs> well, well, you I... felt your chivalry couldn't last out to the end of the minute. <laughs> no, I thought their chivalry was probably fading on the other side there, and I'd better get in. Ah, yes. <laughs> That's... It's a very true thought. You have to decide when the other people are going to be ceased to be shivers. Peter, yeah, I agree with your challenge. It was a repetition of easier. So there are 25 seconds left for you to take over the subject and, of course, a point as well. And how, subject, how to live to be 100 years old starting now. Breathing, of course, is vitally important. <laughs> take long, deep, easy breaths. And if you can continue this for approximately 360,500 days, including holidays, Sundays, and every other day, and leap year. Uh, Clement Freud's challenge, why? Repetition of days. Day, day, days. 365 days, yes, and a day. That's yes, right. I, Sunday. I got so confused because of the Sundays and the Mondays. The producer says it was day and then days. And Sunday. Day and then days. What a difficult thing to have to judge. Yes, I so... think the producer's right, actually. Yeah. Now. <laughs> I think well, back Peter, on it. as you think, think the producer's right, then obviously I disagree with... No, the producer says it was days and days, so Clement Freud, I disagree with the challenge, so that means that Peter Jones gets another point. There are five seconds left for how to live to be 100 years old, starting now. Eating, of course, is also an important... Uh, Clement Freud, why... Repetition of of course. Yes, there was an of course before, I'm afraid. <laughs> so Clement's being very tough. There's three seconds to go on that round. He gains a point for that. And how to live to be 100 years old, Clement, starting now. The problem really starts when you're 99 years old. <laughs> the whistle which is burned by Ian Messeter tells us that 60 seconds is up and whoever is speaking at that particular moment gains an extra point. And this occasion it was, uh, once again, Clement Freud. And at the end of that round, he has... No, he's in the lead, alongside Peter Jones, with two points. Naomi McDonald has one. And Kenneth Williams has yet to score. In fact, he's yet to speak. <laughs> but uh, he's looking very hopeful over there. I'm afraid it's... You Peter. should have added, I'm looking modest. <laughs> you are, you're looking very modest, with a little thing in your lapel. I don't know what it is. It means that I've won the blue riband. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I didn't know. You listeners will probably wonder. He has a blue ribbon in his buttonhole. We thought he was the prefect for the week. That was <laughs> Peter Jones, will you begin the next round? And still on the same theme, obviously. Hundreds and thousands. Can you talk about that subject? 60 seconds, starting now. Picture, if you can, an old-fashioned kitchen of uh, perhaps the latter part of the last century with a Welsh dresser, cupboards, drawers, shelves full of glasses, bottles and boxes containing ground almonds, Valencia balls, currants, <laughs> sultanas, raisins and hundreds of thousands. This is obviously the workroom of someone who is dedicated to the ancient art of cake baking, fruit cakes and the like. Puddings, perhaps, might also be included in the menu of this household. And very fortunate. Oh, Amy McDonald's challenge, why? Um, what do you call it? Deviation. Why? Well, he's talking about houses and, and, and cupboards baking. and shelves and, and things like that. It's nothing to do with hundreds of thousands, has it? Well, I couldn't take them one at a time. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but I think he'd well establish that hundreds and thousands was only one ingredient of all his baking, and he was on the baking and in his houses, Amy. So uh, I agree with your challenge. And so you gain a point. Oh. 
Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and you um, take over the subject with 14 seconds to go, hundreds and thousands starting now. If you want to bake a cake, you take a bowl, you see, and in the bowl you put some flour. Uh, Peter Jones has challenged right. Repetition of bowl. Yes, I quite agree. You have only want one bowl for the cake, Amy, and, and you had two of that. Okay. Uh, so there are eight seconds there for you, Peter, having it another point, and hundreds of thousands is back with you starting now. You take one bowl and a spoon and possibly a dozen eggs and some... Uh, Peter Jones started with the subject and finished with it, and he gained an extra point for speaking when the whistle went, and now he has a lead of two at the end of that round over everybody else. And Kenneth Williams, your turn to begin. Oh, nice. Yes. <laughs> Still on the same theme, the hundred days. Can you talk on that subject for 60 seconds starting now? I presume this. Of course, refers to the return from Elba of Nap or Bonaparte or Napoleon, whichever you prefer to call him. And he deposed, you know, Louis the <laughs> Eighteenth. And of course, his chief of police was Fouché. Now, of course, he was found in his cupboard with uh, a woman Peter in Jones a compromising a position. <laughs> she had a repetition of, of course. So they said, you get out of it. Because <laughs> obviously, you know, she was standing there in only a bra and in being the secret police. They thought we can't act. What's the matter? <laughs> what is it? <laughs> Peter Jones is determined to have you for of course, which you repeated a little while back. But she done about half a dozen also. <laughs> no, oh, I'm right. Peter Jones. Oh, oh, sorry. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Oh, I beg your pardon. Take that wig off. She's <laughs> <laughs> putting on her thing. Just because oh, they're sitting strange. close together. Uh, as it was so long ago, I'd better put it to the audience. Let them no, no, fun. Peter Jones was perfectly correct. He would never challenge frivolously. You're quite right. <laughs> well, I, I yeah, appreciate... No, no, I'd rather it was done that yeah. way. I do assure you. Don't give them any chance. Don't give them a chance. <laughs> You're just throwing it out into mob rule, mate. <laughs> you, you have know now... about the French Revolution. No, I'd repeated, it, of course, earlier. You yes. see, so it was yes. fresh in my mind. And the phrase. <laughs> <laughs> and as you've now worked them up beautifully into a mob, they're entirely on your side. So you know that <laughs> if I put it to them, they'd be for you. And you are being very generous in saying, give it to Peter Jones, because it was accurate. Peter, you have, um, you buzzed actually when there were 34 seconds left. We didn't start the clock again. You have another point, the 100 days starting now. So Napoleon gathered together the remnants of an army and marched into Belgium, where fortunately there awaiting him were the armies of Poland and France. I mean, England. And uh, they were led by the Duke of Wellington, who, with the rest of his military advisers, had been the previous night at the famous ball given by the Duchess of Richmond. And fresh the following morning... Peter Jones was speaking when the whistle went, gained the extra point, and uh, what a lot of history we're learning today, yes. I felt then, like the audience, did you feel we were just about hanging on? Would he get the word out before he was bunched? <laughs> <laughs> Amy MacDonald, we're Amy back Amy. with you, which is always a delightful thought, and the subject that he has us thought of, making excuses. That is the subject, 60 seconds, starting now. I think it's quite wrong, really, to make excuses for things that really don't need making excuses. <laughs> Uh, Kenneth Williams, why to realize, you? I think it's quite wrong, really. Don't no, really, really need making excuses. At the beginning of the program, I talked about chivalry and gallantry, Kenneth. And after five seconds, I hope we'll have a little bit more. I don't think we should allow that, do you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm making an excuse for Emma MacDonald because it's on the car. Oh, I'll turn up in a blonde wig next week. <laughs> Never mind, darling. I'll do something for you sometime, OK? <laughs> You'll have to make a few excuses for him, that's all. Yes. Yeah. Amy, the subject is still making excuses, and there are 54 seconds left, starting now. Yes. I think it's very nice to make excuses for other people, but some people you see are inclined to make excuses... Uh, Kenneth Williams. Other people and some people, two people. Other oh, people no. and some people. 
They're different people completely. <laughs> well, Amy, you had a point last time. This time I must give it to Kenneth because it was a correct challenge. And Kenneth, you have a point now, and there are 40... Six seconds for making excuses starting now. This is one of the ways of explaining away bad behaviour. Now, very often in our lives, someone will say, here, what you, what you up to? And you say, oh, I was just uh, adjusting my raincoat. Whereas, in actual fact, you might have been doing something quite other. Concealing, perhaps, something from the eyes of the customer. Uh, Kevin Freud, why Repetition did you... of something. Yes, you did have something before. So you're doing something else and something. I will so... not get you outside. <laughs> <laughs> Clement Freud, I agree with your challenge. You get a point. 20 seconds for making excuses starting now. Suppose you were walking down Regent Street on a hot day and something became unstuck of, of, in your face. Ah, uh, <laughs> <Kenneth. laughs> You know, Kenneth changes. He's very much a chameleon in just a minute. One minute he's so generous to his little friend next to him, Clement Croy. <laughs> so, you have 11 seconds for making excuses starting now. The other, of course, excuse. Clement Croy challenges. <laughs> of course. He does tend to say, of course. I don't think he said it on this mm, occasion. All the time. He hasn't said it in yeah, this particular round of just a minute, I don't think. So, Kenneth, you have nine minutes making excuses and starting minutes. now. <laughs> Kenneth, There's I'm... no hurry. <laughs> <laughs> Do you, need, you needn't go for nine minutes, it's all right. I'll, I'll take that back and say you can go for nine seconds, making excuses starting now. Dear sir or madam, I cannot attend your function and I have no wish to hand the prizes to your rather dirty children. <laughs> On this occasion, Kenneth Williams was speaking with the whistle when he gained the extra point. At the end of that round, Kenneth Williams is just behind Peter Jones. Clement Freud and Amy are equal in third place, and Peter Jones, it's your turn to begin. The subject, my giddy aunt. Will you talk to us about her or that subject for 60 seconds, starting now? She was born in Wolverhampton, and when she was 18 years of age, she met a young man about two years her senior and they had a brief romance which was nipped in the bud by their respective parents. So her future fiancé left Staffordshire and in fact these shores and went abroad round the world several times on Shale... Uh, Kenneth Williams challenge, why? Repetition, they left these shores, they went abroad. It's repetition, it's both saying the same thing. <laughs> Miss, these shores went abroad. That's yeah, all right. It's perfectly all right. It was a very good try, but I <laughs> disagree with the challenge. He's got to keep going on his giddy arms, and he was doing that successfully. 30 seconds. Another point to you, Peter. Uh, my giddy arms starting now. Returning in the early part of the 1920s, when he, <coughs> returning to his home... Uh, Ken, Clement Freud. Repetition of returning. That's right, yes, he was returning and returning again. So, Clement Freud, you have a point. There are 22 seconds. My giddy aunt starting now. The first time my aunt tried this was on a hurdy-gurdy on the outskirts of Stafford, which is not far from Wolverhampton, paying a token sum... Six... Uh, Peter Jones has challenged. Staffordshire. Is it in Staffordshire or outside? Or is it in Wolverhampton? Where is it? This is not a quiz game. It's called... <laughs> <laughs> well, he's talking about my aunt, and I want to be your aunt. No, no, no. <laughs> There's a very good challenge, Peter. Actually, you see, the subject is my giddy aunt. So once you or Clement Price is my giddy aunt, it does become Clement's giddy aunt. You mean his aunt lives in Staffordshire as well? <laughs> yes. No, in now you realize why yours was so, You now realize why yours was so giddy, don't you? Yes. Yeah. yes. Uh, it was incorrect challenge, Peter, so Clement Price has another point. Ten seconds, my giddy aunt, starting now. Her second bout of giddiness was caused by a fall from the post office tower. She had mounted going by... Uh, Kenneth Williams has Deviation. I do not believe he had any aunt who fell from the post office tower. You know, I'm inclined to Besides agree with which you, it Kenneth. certainly would have been recorded, wouldn't it, Nick? Yes. Mm. <laughs> and uh, I'm inclined to agree with you, Kenneth, so I give you a point and the subject, three seconds, my giddy aunt, starting now. She went round and round 
like a top and I said to her, it's a good second. Do you great fool, otherwise you'll land up in the moat. We were on the vessel ship the castle. Can't mince the castle, I meant to say. <laughs> Not ship. Can and of course, can you... You've been challenged oh, by your friend repetition. next door. Uh, round and around. Around and around, yes, Clement. So very clever, you've got the subject back, mm. so you'll get the points that you were uh, sad about. One second left, my giddy aunt starting now. Up one sideways, along side. <laughs> So, by very sharp listening, Clement Freud came in just before the whistle again. And I mean, he, he's in the lead. He's definitely in the lead. Oh, just ahead of Peter Jones. You're only one point behind Peter Jones, though, is in second place. Oh, thanks. Oh, well, you never know. You might study. It's your turn to begin. Oh, and what a perfect subject that we have for you now. Doing my nut. <laughs> And if you haven't already done it, will you please do it now? This refers... No, wait a minute. <laughs> 60 seconds, starting now. This, of course, refers to those occasions when I swept away by my enormous enthusiasm for a certain subject, tear a passion to tatters, so to speak. And what better way to do it than to take hold of the immortal passage. To speak the speech I flew as I pronounce it, sugar down the tongue, until now that I some of your players, I cannot but make the with the centre of its one without... You've been challenged by Peter Jones. What for? Don't know, I'll find out. <laughs> I can't hear what he says. <laughs> you want to get a death aid, mate? <laughs> Is this a program for geriatrics or something? <laughs> <laughs> I'm still here. They can't hear. Yeah. They can't hear. They can't hear. Yeah. None of us can hear. If it's incomprehensible, it must be wrong. Now, this is a great problem here. You see, I give one of the. Great problem? There's no problem. You've got an invalid over there. Beautiful. It's a very bad taste to make fun of a physical infirmity. <laughs> yes. What You've got a young, falling. virile member of your family here, mate. <laughs> Adrenaline's flowing through me. I'm yes. throbbing with it. Come on, give me have... my subject back. It's no, there's no right to. Pay I them. think you have well illustrated, Kenneth, that uh, doing my nut. You, you've illustrated the subject, but if you go on illustrating it any further, which is incomprehensible to us, then there might be a, a reason for deviation. But as you've illustrated it thoroughly well, 22 seconds left, <clears throat> starting now. King Charles's head is also a term given to the same kind of obsessive enthusiasm. And indeed, when I cast my mind back to that incredible scene in Whitehall when Bishop Truxton said to him, what, sire, are your last words? He replied, I go from a corrupt kingdom. <laughs> well, uh, Kenneth Williams started with the subject, doing my nut. He did his nut extremely well, kept going, finished with the subject. That means I'm in the lead. No. Go on, go on, it does. <laughs> go on. Help me. <laughs> Actually, Kenneth Williams is in the lead alongside his friend Clement Freud. Oh, it's lovely! <laughs> Amy MacDonald, it's your turn to begin. And the subject is why I enjoy dancing the can can. <laughs> and this is the last subject, by the way, because we don't have any more time after this. Will you start now? The thing I enjoy most about dancing the can can is really the music, I suppose. It makes you want to dance, you know, da 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 da. <laughs> uh, Clement Freud, you've reputation of dance. <laughs> no, they're on different notes. Yes, <laughs> they were. They were different dars, weren't they? Yes. Yes, one was a D, actually. Yes, but I'm afraid there were so many dars. I really can't allow you to get away with it, uh, Amy. So, and as it's neck and neck at the lead, I have to say, Clement Freud, you have another point. Fifty seconds. Why I enjoy dancing the can can. I enjoy <laughs> dancing the can can because it is the only. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, he couldn't only. go on, could he? Yes, it is the only. And you have another point, Amy, I'm delighted to say, and there are 47 seconds. Why I enjoy dancing the can-can starting now. Also the swish of the skirts, which creates the most gorgeous smell of material. Um, can you please rise and challenge? It was disgusting, I got it. <laughs> Filth about skirt swishing and smelling. What a quite right, quite disgusting. 
cast. Depends yeah. on the type of nose you have. It's, yeah, a, it's a different it's type of smell. <laughs> right, Amy, you have another point, because we disagree with that challenge, all of us, and there are 40 seconds for why I enjoy dancing the can-can starting now. Also, you are allowed to shout, which is something that one really always feels like doing when one is dancing. But the trouble is, one is not often allowed to. And in the can-can, it is part of the dance. And there's a lovely sensation of whooping and hollering <laughs> and kicking your heels up all at the same time and the swishing of the skirts and it's most <coughs> exhilarating. Uh, Peter Jones is challenged. A uh, repetition of swishing. Yeah, but as she also repeated and about 44 times, I don't know. Well, I ignore the and. I know. But I took exception to the swishing. <laughs> as they could have come in before well, that. Well, that's their see. fault. They weren't paying attention. They're arguing among themselves about some other topic altogether. Probably I the think it's cricket or something. <laughs> Only fair, as they restrained on the ands, you should, have you should have restrained on the swishing. And I give Amy another point to keep the subject with her. 19 seconds. Why enjoy dancing the can can Amy starting now? It also goes on for a considerable length of time. And I used to enjoy dancing it much more than I do now, because at one time I was very young, and this is when I really enjoyed it. The older you get, obviously, the harder it is, you see. When... Peter <laughs> <laughs> Jones has challenged why? I feel that's a personal remark directed at me. <laughs> well, I just take exception to it. It's rather ungracious, I feel. I've abandoned my butt. <laughs> I've abandoned my button altogether. Well, as you've abandoned your button, obviously you don't want the subject, and uh, Amy Madonna must keep it and get another point. Is it For... me again? Be you again. Oh, so, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> Just a minute. Oh, what you are you thinking of? <laughs> no, it's all right. Now I'm ready to go. <laughs> well, we've almost got to the end of the show. I mean, can't you okay, wait? Okay. Oh, right. Um, uh... <laughs> Would you like to relax for a little while? <laughs> back again in half an hour or so. We could go out and have a spot of lunch. Um, at the present moment, um, if we've still got time for the show, there are three seconds for why I enjoy dancing the Can Can Amy starting now. I don't really know why I enjoy it, because really it's the hardest Can it dance. Williams a challenge? Why? No, she doesn't know why. She knows why she shut up and let me know. <laughs> <laughs> As, the, as uh, I don't think anybody in the audience wants her to shut up, I'm not yes. going to ask her to shut up. And uh, there are... Um, half a second. Half a second uh, for Amy MacDonald on There one. are half a second. There are half a second. What's happened to you and your grandma? I was looking at Amy MacDonald. That's what happened to me. <laughs> half a second for you, Amy, to do what you like starting now. You have to be really... <laughs> Well, I'm afraid we have no more time. It's a pity because... But it's a very interesting result, actually, because Amy MacDonald, who actually was very, very clever in that last round, I mean, she never hesitated, she never repeated herself, and she certainly didn't deviate. Because oh, if she did, I didn't notice it. And she has leapt from fourth place into fourth place. <laughs> only one point behind Peter Jones, who was in third place, who was only one point behind Kenneth Williams, who was in second place, who was only one point behind our leader, Clement Freud, who was the winner. And I think that was a very fair result. One point separating them all with Kenneth, Clement Freud, the winner. We, we do hope you've enjoyed this edition of Just a Minute, and from all of us here, goodbye. Chairman of Just a Minute was Nicholas Parsons. The program was devised by Ian Messiter and produced by David Hatch.